With great medical care, you can guarantee your doctor will give you the best leeches to help get rid of that bad causing you to get sick, but because leeches were hard to come by and it was an actual occupation for someone to get leeches to sell to doctors, the profession in itself was actually getting pretty expensive as well. And so the artificial leech was created. During the Victorian period, scientific and medical research boomed as doctors experimented with all kinds of cures and treatments as according to researchers of this era. Using leeches for bloodletting also proved so popular it led to the shortage of the worms. And so this artificial leech was used to stimulate and simulate the similar effects of extracting said bad blood out. Which to be honest may work for some treatments, after all bloodletting is still used today, in the treatments of a few diseases including hemochromatosis and polysynthemia. It's even practiced by specifically trained practitioners in the hospital hospitals using techniques also known as therapeutic phlebotomy. I mean, if you were sick, would you use the real leech or an AI one? But that was the thing with professionals of their craft is that they always wanted to make something more simple like George Eugene Frederick Kastner who wanted to do something that every person would enjoy like when you go to church it would be so exciting if you saw an exploding organ. Yes, George wanted the organ to be so dramatic, he made and designed an organ which blew out fire out of its windpipes instead of just normal wind. I swear in The Simpsons they had an episode where some guy was playing this exact organ or was it Family Guy? I don't know. But you know what would be funny if by some comedic effect, imagine they were going to show this invention off but they didn't tell anyone the pipes were going to blast fire so they thought you know what would be the best place to show off our cool new invention during a funeral. So they would blast his organ at a very important part of the sermon just to scare everybody. Again, I have no idea why he wanted to have the pipes blast fire, but I think he was just bored. Speaking of exploding objects, of course fire was a scary notion in the Victorian era as it was very prevalent and very difficult to reduce. They didn't really have much to prevent these great fires that has affected large populations and portions of towns and cities. Especially if your exploding organ exploded, you might want to have a backup plan. So the exploding organ resulted in the creation of the exploding hand grenade fire extinguisher as it was born. Originally the thought was, hey if we can't get to all the areas all at once, why don't we just toss a new hand grenade fire extinguisher, as this fire extinguisher was designed to be thrown like a hand grenade and it was patented in 1883. However, the glass bottle contained poisonous toxic liquids which could enter the body damaging the lungs, kidneys and liver. So you can toss it but just stay very far away from it. In the end though, this invention turned out to be a flop and although the concept was nice, it didn't do much. But let's say it did get too hot and no, the new hand grenade fire extinguisher couldn't do the job. But you know what might be? Your hat. It can be very hot in the summer and even if you want to look fashionable, it can be tough when your outfit is drenched in sweat. So in order to avail from getting sweaty, try the new air conditioner top hat. This wonderful and underachieved invention is the Bonafide Ventilated Top Hat as it advertised by John Fuller and Company in 1849. The Bonafide Ventilating Hat would have allowed men to wear hats without overheating as it has a vent at the top of the hat and basically be able to circulate air into the man's head while he's still wearing said hat. I said hat so many times you can take a shot. I mean don't do that. I mean it was also a moderate trend like every other trend but that we see but it didn't last as trends die out hard. And I feel like if you were bald you might want to try this invention out as it might be better because you don't have hair. But speaking of hair, there might be some who might find the electric hairbrush pretty fascinating as this fashionable hairbrush is actually powered by magnets despite its advertisements of being an electric hairbrush. Because what's common in the Victorian era is false advertising or clickbaits. When you go to your local salesman or even to an eccentric bloke on the street, he might harass you and your family enjoying the evening to promote his electric hairbrush. After all, brushing one's hair is a tedious task, especially if it's very long. Actually, this was powered by magnets as they were marketed at, but Victorians who feared of going bald really was the main people that they were looking at. But of course that wasn't enough for the superficial markets of the Victorian era so they had to sprinkle sprinkle some white lies or some incentives. They also claimed these electric hairbrushes could cure constipation, malaria, lameness, rheumatism, and blood diseases and paralysis. I think the reason why so many inventions led to other medical illnesses is because the Victorian era they had so many and were not always able to fight the root cause of their ailments. But don't worry, after all things like the electric corset would help you if you're feeling sick. When you think about a corset you might think it was utilized as a fashion or shapewear type of fabric but apparently this was also used to help women with a weak back, chills, and of course, rheumatism, created and patented by a man named Cornelius Bennett Harness. He said that every married man should buy an electric corset for his wife, if he loves her. In the ad, it says, in appearance of these corsets do not differ from those usually worn, being made of the same material and parentheses best quality. In the latest style and most approved shapes, they are in fact the best thing for ladies, young or old, especially those who have a weak back, chills, or rheumatism, and even hysteria. It also helps with internal complaints, loss of appetite, and nervous dyspepsia 
kidney disorders, and so much more. Man, a corset can do it all? Either way, he got sued because the electric corset was actually magnetic rather than electric. All it had was a magnetized steel busk of the plates at the front that attached together to fasten the corset. The articles and the sellings of this corset ended up being a flop anyway. As a result, it to a lot of customers demanding their money back. Even at one point, they got arrested because of the scams, and the jury couldn't make a formal decision about Harness. The courts ordered that the company would be wound up, and almost immediately, Harness had to try to resurrect himself as in a medical electric institute and was allowed to do so in the condition it was under an actual qualified medic. Didn't end up working out though, as his reputation as a shady man was already out in the open. But hey, if your back was already broken because of the corset, you might as well do some physiotherapy. But it wasn't officially noted at the time of the Victorian era, but it was definitely something that they were on their way into developing. Well, to be honest, in the Victorian era, they had the idea of exercise being good for you, but not so much to the extent of knowing how. So they made this exercise chair. It was basically a swing with springs, and you just sit on it and bounce. Kind of like a baby bouncer, but for adults. And so for this reason, the machine was used to just have you force sit and bounce. I mean, I don't know. It just seems lazy. But every person's fitness journey is unique to them, so maybe it'll help jumpstart for you, or sit start, or bounce start. I don't know, man. Well, you know what I mean. But in some good intentions, the invention was also helpful to those who were disabled and helped them get to exercise. Maybe the chair should come back. What do you think? I mean, something that could come back are these spectacle, parasol spectacles, or umbrella spectacles. I don't know. It came across the mind of one inventor to combine your parasols with glasses, also known as the lunette parasol. And the reason this was made was so that you could peek out of the umbrella like the chismosa you are. It's interesting, though, when you see these inventions. I also think about the modern day Japan, and they also have inventions for random things, like a tiny fan to cool your ramen before you eat it, or a face mask bib to prevent your hair from falling into your ramen. But the Victorians, who didn't really have ramen, were way ahead of their time as everyone else were inventing things like the mustache guard. Yes, for ladies, you don't need to worry about your mustache, but for the men who drank a lot of tea, coffee, or drank anything in general, their mustaches would get in the way. So the Acme mustache guard was born, a solid comfort while eating and drinking, and no need to use napkins. Apparently, it was made out of gold or silver plating, and it can be carried into your pocket and has different sizes respected to the mustache. Length. And it was at a retail price of $2. Doesn't seem too bad when you think about it, but when you realize it was back in the day, that's apparently $4,500 now. Would you still buy it? I don't do it. But when you can't afford your $4,500 mustache guard, you can end up stealing it and will end up in jail for a theft. And of course, criminals in the prison systems weren't able to avoid the wacky invention world of the Victorian era. They might have been forced to do the hand hard labor machine, a hand crank for criminals. The manufacturer boom of the time created this hand crank meant for prisoners sentenced to hard labor. Basically, this crank machine was a device which would turn a crank by hand, which is in turn forced your four large cups or ladles through the sand inside a drum, doing nothing. Thing. Useful, but just turning. Male prisoners had to turn the handle 6,000 to 14,400 times over the period of a six hour day work period. I guess we do have to use our tax dollars towards something. Number 10, ancient telescope. The Nimrod lens. It's a 3,000 year old rock crystal lens discovered in modern day Iraq in the mid 1800s. Now, it was discovered quite recently, but back then, this thing was like ancient technology. Today, we have the James Webb Space Telescope. 3,000 years ago, they were more advanced than we think. The lens is believed to have been made by a Syrian craftsman sometime around 750 BC. It's the oldest known example right now of a magnifying lens, which is, sounds kind of nerdy, but that's cool. That's kind of a, one of those facts that makes me go, oh, interesting, I like that. Up until then, everybody was just squinting a lot, really. We didn't have anything to zoom in on. The lens is quite small in size. It's no James Webb, that's for sure. It's around three centimeters in diameter and a focal length of 12 centimeters. So again, not James Webb, but it was something, right? It was anything. The exact purpose of the Nimrod lens is still up for debate. That's still unknown, but it's thought to have been used for decorative or ceremonial purposes, or possibly, hopefully, magnifying things things to study small objects because man, that's science right there. It's technology. The Nimrod lens is the first example of ancient optical technology. That's cool. Imagine building that. It's crazy. Number nine, the iron pillar. Remember when monoliths started to appear all around the world? We were all talking about it for like a month and then we just stopped. What happened with that? That's concerning. This next one rings a similar bell. The iron pillar of Delhi. It's a 7.3 meter tall iron column and it's located in the Kitab complex in Delhi, India. Now it went up sometime during the Gupta period. So sometime around the third and 4th century AD. And it's been standing for over 1600 years without rusting or corroding at all, which is impressive. That and like the Egyptian pyramids, we have no idea how this happened. The column is notable for its high quality iron compositions and advanced forging techniques used to create it. We still can't figure out just 
how that was done considering how long ago it was made. The iron pillar is also covered in several inscriptions in the Sanskrit language, which is pretty exciting, providing valuable ancient history about the Gupta Empire, and also, again, in remarkable condition, which is super rare. The pillar attracts visitors from all over the world. Wanna go see a pillar? I kinda wanna go see a pillar now. That'd be a crazy trip. Number eight, the Antikythera mechanism. Computers today, we can, we can fit them in our pockets, but ancient Greek analog computers, apparently you can also fit those in your pockets. Who knew? The Antikythera mechanism was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses for calendrical and astrological purposes. That sounds scientific, wow. It was discovered in 1901 in the Antikythera shipwreck, hence its name, and it's estimated to have been built around 150 and 100 BC. Now the mechanism consists of at least 30 bronze gears and it was operated by turning a crank. This is again, like ancient technology, this is amazing. It's rusty and full of barnacles now, but back then in its prime, this mechanism would accurately display the positions of the sun, the moon, and planets on specific dates, as well as predict solar and lunar eclipses. Some guy in the back's like, spoilers, it's tomorrow, told you. The mechanism is considered a remarkable technological achievement for its time and provides valuable insights into the history of ancient Greek astronomy and technology, all in one rusty box right there. Think of what we haven't found yet, you know what I mean? I'm nervous, I'm so nervous. Humans are quite advanced. Number seven, ancient seismoscope. Zhanghang seismoscope is an ancient Chinese instrument that was used to detect and measure earthquakes. And it looked pretty badass. I'm not gonna lie, this thing looks pretty cool. It was invented by renowned scientist, mathematician, and astronomer Zhang Heng. It was made during the Han Dynasty around 132 CE. The seismoscope consisted of a bronze vessel that rested on the back of a bronze dragon, a dragon, with eight open mouthed toads positioned beneath it. Yeah, it's scientific, but it's also a beautiful instrument, right? Like I said, it's badass. So when an earthquake would happen, a mechanism inside the vessel would trigger the release of the ball from one of the toad's mouths, indicating the direction of the earthquake. He'd be like, nah, that way. And everyone would be like, okay, cool. Let's go this way then. Today it's a little different. Today it's, it's not, it's fun. It's just graphs and charts. Looks like some avatar technology, whatever. No toads puking up any balls in any direction, so. Ergo boring. Number six, the Baghdad battery. Also known as the Parthian battery. This is an ancient device that would go back to 248 BC. Why am I doing this? Am I Italian? Am I Steve Jobs? I'm walking around like, ah yes, I invented this. Look at my loose wrist here. Why do I, I gotta keep these down. Keep these at bay here. The battery consists of a clay jar, a copper cylinder, and an iron rod. All of which were found together in what is now modern day Iraq. It's believed that the device was used to generate an electric current by filling the jar with an acidic liquid like vinegar, or wine. I sound like Bill Nye the science guy right now, but then they would insert copper and iron components after, and then they would make electricity. They would make, I don't know, t here, Tony Stark would make this. I don't know, it's crazy. The purpose of the Baghdad battery is still unknown, which is fascinating. I won't be able to sleep at night now, but it's thought to have been used for electroplating or medicine or as a religious artifact. And today we're like, well, we have no idea. This is the stuff that I love, old, ancient, like this sounds like something from Breath of the Wild that I would find. Number five. Ancient Greek fire. Okay, this one's pretty epic. It's not, uh, I mean, it, it's horrible. It's pretty rough history here, but definitely interesting nonetheless. Greek fire was used by the Eastern Roman Empire from the 7th to the 12th century. Now, the formula for Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, which is like so villainous, but it's believed to have contained petroleum, quicklime, and other combustible substances, all in one soup, just a big hot mess. Something you don't wanna drop, really, ideally. Greek fire was delivered using a flamethrower-like device on a boat called a siphon, and it was capable of igniting on water, making it a very reliable weapon against any ship out there. Yeah, they would shoot hot fire through a giant syringe at enemy ships. Ancient history is cool, it's impressive, but it's also, most of the time, brutal. It's disgusting, my God. Number four, mechanical clocks. Look, we all love an hourglass, all right? I love an hourglass. Playing a board game with the family, you aggressively flip that thing down, no better feeling, right? Tick tock, sands are swirling. But why don't we have an hourglass anymore? Why don't we use those? Those are pretty sweet, it's a pretty amazing invention. Let's talk about those for a bit. During the medieval period, the invention of mechanical clocks revolutionized timekeeping and replaced the use of hourglasses. One guy's like, what? I love these though. That's me, I'm the guy. Mechanical clocks were first invented in Europe in the 13th century and they were initially used in public spaces like churches, town squares, stuff like that. These early clocks relied on the energy generated by falling weights to power their movements. Yeah, you're not gonna have one of these next to your bed. Not for a while, at least. Mechanical clocks allowed for more precise timekeeping and helped standardize time across different regions. But back then it was scary. Back then it was weights and big things bonging around above your head. It's like, what time is it? I don't know. The only one we got. Number three. 
the blast furnace. This one was also quite important. All these are pretty important, but this one's, you know, wasn't used to destroy a human being, so it's good. The blast furnace, it's a medieval invention that revolutionized the production of iron, which is so key. We love that over here in Steamville with iron everywhere. I don't know, just trains literally all around us. It was first introduced in Europe during the 14th century and it quickly became a game changer. The furnace's design allowed for higher temperatures and more efficient use of fuel, leading to increased iron production and most importantly, lower costs, which yeah, blacksmiths love this, you know? They hate this one trick. The blast furnace would also enable the production of higher quality iron that was suitable in wider ranges of applications, which again, we love that. We love when iron just stays in one spot. Usually it's how we like our iron. We made better, faster iron. I don't know, what a day. It sounds like a Daft Punk song. Harder, better, faster iron. This invention spread across Europe, of course, with many regions becoming iron production hot zones. A lot of blacksmiths in the area, a lot of a lot of beards. Single blacksmiths in your area. Just swipe, here we go. Number two, the printing press. I'm not a fan of homework, but I get it. It's gotta be done sometime. The printing press, of course we have to include this. This is a revolutionary invention during, again, the medieval period that allowed for the mass production of books and pamphlets. I love pamphlets, thank God. Love me a good pamphlet. I love flipping things only thrice and then closing it, that's it. No more than three. Invented by Johannes Gutenberg in the mid 15th century, the printing press could reproduce text more quickly and Again, it was pretty cheap considering what came before. You had to pay a guy to do everything. That's crazy. You gotta listen to him all day? No. You gotta feed him? No. This had quite the impact on society and enabled wider access to knowledge, the spread of ideas, and it contributed to the growth of literacy, which again, we love that. Still leading towards that one. The printing press played a key role in the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation, and it may or may not have helped lay the foundation for the modern world. So I guess, yeah, we can put this close to number one, I would say, or number two is pretty good. And finally, number one, flutes. Yeah, we're ending on flutes, the best, right? We had to learn it for three years in school. Why? Couldn't tell you. No idea, we had to do it though. Music has been in the air for a very, very long time. Neanderthals enjoyed a flute every now and then. Who would have thunk? They weren't playing We Three Kings like us, you know, but they were making music as early as 50,000 years ago, which is just baffling. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of Geist and Closer Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments ever that have ever been discovered, period. They were made from bird bone and the ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, if that's any indication how old they are, they made music out of mammoth ivory. Again, I still can't play the recorder. I, I never learned. I was useless. My fingers were too long. I'd always like slip off the holes. I got Jack Skellington fingers. I can't play your recorder. No way. Number 10, Greek fire. You know what's scary? Fire. You know what's even scarier than that? Someone who can shoot streams of fire at you. While some people love the smell of napalm in the morning, they are usually the people doing the firing. And it wasn't just shirtless Americans who did the firing, no. Somehow, the ancient Greeks also used a proto-napalm that would be used against other ships in naval warfare. The substance would apparently cling to flesh and was impossible to extinguish with water. What puzzles us is that the recipe for Greek fire was never told to anyone. It was a secret on the same level as the Krabby Patty secret formula. People have experimented with different ingredients that the Byzantine Empire had access to. The Mythbusters, my favorite scientists, used naphtha, which is made from a light crude oil, mixed with pine resin, and they burned down a ship in a few seconds. I'm sure at the time, people thought that those who used Greek fire were wielding the power of a god or something. Number nine, Damascus steel. While off on the Crusades, a lot of Europeans came into contact with things they'd never seen before. Spices, for example. Please cut it with the bland food, guys, please. Another thing they saw were warriors who wielded blades that could slice through floating handkerchiefs, but also bend to ridiculous degrees without breaking. These blades were made from what was called Damascus steel. But for some reason, we actually have no idea what these blades were actually made of, or what the process for making it could even be. Some people think it could have been made by mixing iron with plant matter, which could have given the kind of flexibility I'll never have. But we don't know what plant matter, and we don't even know for sure that's how it was done. Best guess is that it was made of crucible steel, which, <laughs> can I just say, sounds really cool. But that's just a theory. Uh, wait, that's the wrong channel. Number eight, the Voynich Manuscript. This may be a little bit insensitive of me, but the drawings in the Voynich Manuscript kind of look like the same things I used to doodle in my notebooks when I stopped paying attention in class. I definitely never wrote like that though. The Voynich Manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich 
who was a Polish collector and bookseller in 1912 when he acquired the manuscript. It's from around the 15th century and is written in this really cool looking code with strange drawings. The font actually kind of reminds me of the font from Lord of the Rings. Does anyone else see that or am I, am I weird? A lot of the pictures drawn in the book seem to be plants. But then you get the random page that has a string of what looks like pregnant women and you're back to square one. I don't know, but I'm still going with somebody's encrypted notebook with fun doodles for when they're bored. Number seven, Ulfbort swords. How do you make a sword that your society did not have the technology for? That is an excellent question, and it is the question that Viking Ulfbert swords pose to historians. The problem with Ulfbert swords is that the technology required for making them did not appear until about 800 years later. Now the thing that kind of bothers me with that assumption is we are assuming that it didn't appear until 800 years later because we haven't found evidence to prove otherwise, except for the swords themselves. In Viking society, a lot of stuff was made with wood and other degradable things, which makes it really hard to know too much about the ancient peoples. What's really interesting is how a Viking sword bearing an Arabic inscription was found. Perhaps these swords were made with Damascus steel, the recipe for which was given to the Vikings through trade, maybe? We need more evidence to know for sure. Number six, Baghdad battery. Do you know how a battery works? Allow me to explain. I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that it involves chemistry. Google tells me the chemical reactions in a battery involve the flow of electrons from one material to another through an external circuit. I don't know. We often think of batteries as a moderately modern invention. And for the most part, that's true. But then there's the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, or batteries because there were a bunch of them, were discovered outside modern day Baghdad in Iraq in 1936. And it's basically a clay pot with a copper cylinder inside of it. Inside the copper cylinder was an iron rod held in place with asphalt. Now, if you take an electrolyte liquid like like even grape juice or something, and put it in the pot, the pots now become batteries, generating about two volts of electricity. The crazy thing about this is that they were found in a Paleolithic village, which is like the Stone Age. We have absolutely no idea what the electricity was used for, but probably because it's fun to administer minor electrical shocks to yourself, right? Number five, Iron Pillar. The Iron Pillar of Delhi is well, it's pretty self-explanatory, actually. It's, it's an iron pillar, which is more than 1,600 years old. I leave my bike out in the rain for like three days, and it's a rusty pile of junk. But this thing has been out in the open for all those years, and it never gained a single speck of rust. How the heck is that possible? I don't know. None of us actually know. Some people think it might have to do with the climate in Delhi, as if it was just in the perfect spot to not rust. But then others think it has to do with the phosphorus and absence of sulfur and manganese in the iron, plus its size. I don't know, my pea-sized brain won't be able to tell you the answer, but it certainly is a puzzling one. Number four, Chinese seismoscope. At first glance, I can confidently say that I would not assume this was the seismoscope. It was basically a big old pot with a bunch of dragons around the outside that would symbolize each direction on a compass. And when an earthquake would happen, the dragon that represented the direction the quake came from would spit out a ball into a bronze toad's mouth. Now, apart from bronze dragons spitting balls into bronze frog mouths, this is an extremely sophisticated device. And absolutely no one knows how it works. We have guesses about what could do it, but this thing can detect the direction of earthquakes 400 miles away. That's insane. And they still made it into a work of art. I am impressed. Good show, good show. Number three, Antikythera mechanism. I kinda hate when people think complex things in history had to be because of aliens. Just because these people were ancient does not mean that they were stupid. They just didn't have the vast amounts of shared knowledge we have now. Then you show me the Antikythera mechanism and all I can think is aliens. This thing was probably built around the second century BC and it had the capability of calculating and displaying things like the phases of the moon and the lunisolar calendar, which is just crazy. We know that people did study that and gear based tech like this had actually been a thing for a long, long time before. it. We think of computers as modern things, but there were machines capable of doing calculations before electricity and computer chips. 
Some of us have to start giving these ancient civilizations more credit instead of just jumping to aliens or to time travel. Number two, Roman dodecahedron. 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 Oh, what? Oh yeah, sorry, I got a video to make. Uh, here, look at this thing. This is a Roman dodecahedron, and guess what? We have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do. But we do know that Europe has tons of these, and they all date back to the Roman era. Like all dodecahedra, it has 12 sides, and each side has a differently sized hole. They also have strange bulbs on each corner. They would range in sizes too, being anywhere from 4 to 11 centimeters. I'm honestly stumped about what it could be. People have theorized they could be uh, paperweights, toys, candle holders, dice, or even a thing used to measure finger sizes for rings. Let me know what you think it could be. Number one, Easter Island. If you thought this point was gonna be about the huge statues on the island, well, think again. While those statues are a mystery all on their own, this point is actually gonna be about Rongo Rongo. What the heck is Rongo Rongo? Well, Rongo Rongo is possibly a form of ancient writing. What makes it stand apart is that it is almost nothing like any other form of writing from any other culture in the world, at least that we know of. Look at this really handy dandy rock that's covered in the writing. Can you make anything out of it? Apparently, the symbols are based on Polynesian religious motifs. My brain is just a, a smidge too slow to get any kind of information out of it. It just makes me really wish I had a secret language, you know? Number 10, grid-based cities. Next time you find yourself at 2nd Avenue and East 59th Street in New York and get into a car accident or are just enjoying the pleasures of Manhattan traffic, you can thank the Romans. Also, shout out to New York. Chetty loves you. What's going on, New York? How you doing? How you doing? No, how you doing? Yes, it was the Romans who began to develop cities and Rome into a grid-like pattern. In a time before roads full of cars, this makes sense. I mean, come on, how much space and traffic can horses and carriages take up? There are benefits to building your city in a grid pattern. It's walkable, easy to navigate, and you can size up the city pretty well. I play a lot of city builders. I like those games, those games are fun. SimCity. Trust me, I would know. This is also true so long as your city isn't packed with skyscrapers and bumper to bumper in rideshare vehicles. You kind of lose the plot when you get to a big city like that, but they started it, there it was. Number nine, arches. For the dudes who like feet, this one is not for you. Ain't those kind of arches, dude, sorry. Today I'm talking about Roman arches. Someone somewhere in Rome discovered that the shape of an arch actually makes for a very effective uh, building. I know, who would have thought? You can tell because as soon as they were discovered, they were popping up everywhere, like pimples on prom night. Simple geometry makes complex architecture. Arches can handle their loads, even if they are overbearing. And trust me, I've seen some overbearing loads in my lifetime. Where's an arch when you need one? The arch simply is a mainstay of Roman architecture and a small part of what made up of the magnificent constructions. I'll get more to that on later. You'll see, you'll see. Number eight, sewers and sanitation. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, and the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Man, I love that quote. Both historical and comical. It's kind of like, I think that's why you guys like to watch me sometimes, right? We'll try it. Well, we'll see. Best of both worlds. Well, it's true. The Romans understood how important sanitation was. While perhaps not the first invention of such, they are the inventors of the modern use of such. The Mediterranean is gorgeous, but after a diet of fish from the sea and pasta, well, you gotta go. One of the ways Romans did this was public bathrooms, except it's more like a room where you and the whole city just do what must be done in front of one another. There's no, no stalls, it's kind of just lined up. It's kind of, it's a, it's a little gross, a little bit. So yes, the sanitation was a great thing, but going together all at once? Well, I, I don't have to tell you how bad that was. Especially, you know, public washrooms, you know how they can be bad. Especially with open stalls, that just can't, mm. Ah, no good. Number seven, roads. All roads lead to Rome. This might sound very stupid, but to us, the Roman roads did change history. Given that there's still Roman roads out there right now that have survived 2,000 years of climate and use, it's pretty impressive. 
And then there's our modern roads that give in after a couple bad winters in your grandfather's boat of a Buick creating potholes every time he breaks. The roads considered of layers of rock and dirt that made for a sturdy road. Hundreds of civilians, horses, traders, carts traveling back and forth on Roman roads every day. Imagine how hard it would be to get to the next city over with no car and no road. That's some rough traveling. Too bad we couldn't have them back or build our roads today. I've got some Daenerys for the next Roman to build me a road, baby. Come on, come on over, build us a road. Number six, aqueducts. These are honestly amazing feats of engineering. Even today, it's, it's, it's a lot of bricks to lay down for a little bit of water. So the question is, you build a very busy city, probably the most impressive city and cities of the ancient era. You need two things for all those folks, water and food. Okay, well, we can do farms outside the city walls, no problem, but Water, we need people to drink water and those, those farms need water too. How do you get water to a busy city center? Aqueducts, basically a long bridge that connects freshwater springs to the fountains in the city, essentially running water. This for the time was very incredible. Hundreds if not thousands of years ahead of their time. To be able to walk into town and drink fresh water was a luxury, one that Rome might have taken for granted. Now every home has running water, and it's great and we all love it. You love tap water, I love tap water. Where's my Brita? Number five, Roman numerals. Attack of the math. Look, I don't want to give the Romans too much credit, but Gosh darn, I guess they did a lot. Sure, we don't use their numbers in regular life today, but they still appear in places once in a while. Uh, like the Star Wars movies, they use them. Uh, they have titles and, and names, and, and, and sometimes just to confuse students when trying to tell time. Sometimes the clocks have Roman numerals on them for some reason. For once, that was something actually I didn't struggle with in school. Who would have thought? The Roman numeral system is based on certain letters representing ones and tens until it gets into larger denominations and more letters get, get thrown in. Basically, anything from 1 to 1,000, you're good. You're doing great. After that, eh, you're going to need some more papyrus. I had enough trouble with algebra and adding some letters to my numbers in math class, but now my numbers are actually just letters? Whoa, I don't think, uh, I don't think so, cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. Nope, I'll be in drama class. Much easier. I'm not going to math class. I'm going to drama class. No. Nope. Number four, the Julian calendar. Imagine being such a mighty and powerful leader that you get a calendar named after you. Yes, the Julian calendar is named after Julius Caesar, the man, the myth, the legend. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we don't use that calendar today, do we? Well, as it turns out, we do. Most of the world goes by the Gregorian calendar from Pope Gregory, which was a revision of the Julian calendar. Yeah, I know, I was surprised too. I didn't know that. Wait till you hear where the months of August and July come from. Your boy Augustus, and yet again, Julius Caesar. Yes, the dude made a whole month for himself and just threw it in there. Okay, now hear me out. We're gonna break, we're gonna break some stuff down here, ready? Octa, Nova, and Deca are all prefixes for eight, nine, and 10, right? Just like October, November, and December are the eighth, ninth, and 10th months out of the year. Well, that makes sense. Big prank though. Uh, I got you. nice try, because after July and August were added, the others got pushed back. But it's crazy what you can do with a little power. It's crazy. So now October, November, December are 10, 11, and 12. They got pushed back. See, it's crazy. You ever wonder that? See, that's how they did it. It makes, I just, I, there's some people like, I actually didn't know that. I open up your mind, brother. That's what I do. That's what I do here. Number three, the empire business. I'm in the empire business. Yes, all Walter White and Saul Goodman references aside. Also, good show. Watch it. When one thinks of empires, the Romans just come to mind. Many have come and gone, and others have had bigger and lasted longer. However, none really had the influence and power of the mighty Roman Empire stretching all over the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and even some parts of the Middle East. Senatus Populus Romanus. She was glorious. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. Years of corruption in government, war, difficulty in controlling its empire from being too big, and just a lack of communication. Takes a long time to get messages around. And maybe the biggest religious reform led to, to the capital moving east, and the empire being split into east and west, and then those Byzantine guys showed up, and it got a little crazy. There's east and west, and then some Ottomans, it, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah, it didn't last forever. Sucks. Number two, concrete. There's something in that concrete, and this is related back to the arches I was talking about earlier. See, told you we get there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, told you. None of the gorgeous buildings Rome had ever constructed would be possible without use of their concrete. Using volcanic ash and lime mixed with a base aggregate made for a very tough and durable solid building material. You can even use this stuff underwater. Sounds like I'm giving you guys a sales pitch. 
It gets tougher as time goes on, and some Roman sites with buildings made of this miracle stuff have little to no wear on the material itself. That's pretty impressive. I spent countless hours awake in the late hours of the night watching dudes make Roman concrete. Am I a builder? No. Am I a tinkerer? No. Should I have been in bed? Yes. However you look at it, it's just cool stuff. There's some cool videos out there. It's really cool stuff. But it like lasts forever. Like the, the buildings are actually gone, but like the concrete itself, dude, you could use it again. It's no like it's it's insane. It's just where did we go wrong? Number one, entertainment. Show business. <laughs> After bread and wine comes entertainment. Okay, no, they didn't invent fun, because Romans probably had a different idea of fun than we do. All you have to do is look at the Colosseum and some of the other large sports event centers they built. Yeah, it wasn't just the Colosseum in Rome, but across the Roman Empire, there was more. Why? Because they needed to be entertained. Gladiators, lions, fights, you know, you know what was going on. There's always been actors, storytellers, but it was the Romans who made it theatrical. If you ask any acting teacher, that's gonna tell you what counts. The theatrics. And to start us at number 10 is the car phone. Our first dabbling with mobile phones ironically came in the form of our vehicles. These funky and clunky phones could be carried in briefcases that were to be stored and charged in the car, or were straight up just built into it. This could be in the center or backseat console, the dashboard, the driver's side door, endless possibilities. The car phone was at its best and most high tech during the 90s and was definitely part of the very important technology for very important people fad and a mindset. If you weren't born to see them in person, perhaps you've seen them in 90s film and TV hits, shows like Seinfeld and Friends, and iconic scenes like in Die Hard when Bruce Willis is saving the day and they flip to a shot of Argyle oblivious of the chaos above whilst talking to a sweet honey on the car phone. I hope you have fast reflexes because Bop It is number 9. Originally invented in 1996, this handheld toy quickly became worldwide success and a popular toy. Models have been winning numerous awards for electronic toys and games. To John your memory or teach some new folks, the original game of Bop It has three main features. Bop It was a button on the side, Twist It was a twisting handle on the lower left side, and Pull It was a pullable handle near the top. The device would call out one of the three instructions, increasing the speed as the game progressed. Whenever the player fumbled or missed the call, the game was over. Player scores are announced at the end of the gameplay with a cipher in which different tones represent different point values, and the maximum possible score is 100. The three were spread enough to require quick reflex and have three game modes, solo play, multiplayer play, and beat bopping, which followed a musical tone. This game was the first of what was later to become a series of bop it games, relying on the same set of basic patents. For number eight, it's the Palm Pilot. Let's take a second and remember this pre-cell phone cell phone, the grandmother of handheld digital devices. PDAs, personal digital assistants for my young people, were truly beloved of the 90s, but none more so than the Palm Pilot, which took everyone by storm. A businessman glued to his Palm Pilot was an ongoing cliche in 90s movies. They could check emails, work on documents, they had little games on them as well. They came with a writing stylus that would only work on the screen of that device, convenient until you lost yours and had to go out and buy a new one. Yes, they truly had all the features of a futuristic parking meter with its unlit display and few hundred kilobytes. This device is laughable if you have an 8 gigabyte phone because you have the memory storage of 16,000 Palm Pilots. The toy that could get us all out of absences at school talk boy is number seven, the perfect symbol of 90s tech. Clunky, obsolete, tied to a beloved 90s franchise and featuring a payoff that, for the time, was an amazing novelty. It was seriously just a video cassette in a little player upon which you could record and play back your own voice or somebody else's. No part of that setup is still relevant whatsoever. The audio recorder only had two features, speeding and slowing down recorded vocals. But that was good enough to pull off a few unbelievable pranks, pretend to be your parents on the phone or mess with some bullies, as was shown to us all by Kevin McAllister in Home Alone 2. The second this chunky device was used in the hit franchise, it had kids everywhere clamoring to have one. And lest we forget, the talk boy also had a cooler, sleeker cousin, the Yak Back, which could only record a few seconds of sound and play it forward or backwards like an auditory vine or TikTok of 90s audio toys. Number six, annoying but efficient, beepers. Also called pagers, these devices were fantastic for reaching someone right away. 
way. How they worked was a caller email is forwarded to the pager, a message comes in with a number to call, although hardly used anymore, pagers remain one of the most reliable forms of communication available, and are still widely used by doctors, as there's no delay in delivery, no network overload, and no dead zones. They had to be reachable at all times, but only in an archaic, indirect way. Someone pages you, and then you have to go find a telephone and call them back. You also definitely kept a list of all the codes you needed to understand in the messages you received in your back pocket. That's why when you've watched medical dramas, there's always that scene of a doctor being paged, checking the mini radio frequency device, and then suddenly running away. If someone had a pager, they were usually important or needed it for work, but most people had them by the late 90s. People used to say, beat me, and it was a really cool thing. Meanwhile, today's grade schoolers are walking around with fully functioning iPhones like they're expecting a call from Rihanna at any second. Clear Craze was a nightmarish 90s product fad that brought up number five, Crystal Pepsi. This soft drink was made by PepsiCo and initially released in Canada and the United States from 1992 to 1994. As a result of the 1980s to 90s clear craze, as I mentioned, this craze started because the idea of a clear product was a pure product. As we know, this is 100% not true, but Crystal Pepsi was one of the many clear and colorless products released by manufacturers such as Soapsoft, Miller Brewing Company, Palm Olive, and more. In Crystal Pepsi's first year, it captured one full percentage point of US soft drink sales, or approximately 474 million, the equivalent to 889 million in 2021. By late 1993, the manufacturer discontinued the beverage. In 2013, a video of Kevin Strahl drinking a vintage 90s bottle of Crystal Pepsi went viral. This video alone sparked tens of thousands of petition signatures to bring the drink back. Even billboards were erected to demand for it. This interest from this campaign led to an official response to Strahl by PepsiCo on June 8th of 2015, commenting on the YouTuber and his fans' commitment and enthusiasm with the teaser of the drink's return. And so in mid-2016, Crystal Pepsi was released across the United States and Canada, promoted with a retro-style website and marketing video. The funny thing is, it tastes like normal Pepsi. You may not remember the item, but your ankles will. Number four, the Skip It. Whoo, my shins hurt just thinking about it. it. During its initial release in the 1980s, the Skip It toy became a commercial success through its advertisements on daytime TV such as Nickelodeon and Boomerang, as well as other children's programming. It was based off of the toy of the exact same concept, the Lemon Twist from the 1960s. A Skip It is a weighted plastic ball that ties around the ankle. A stretch of cord in between your ankle and the ball is skipped over as you swing the weighted ball around 360 in a circle. Oh yeah, those suckers could whip back at any second and give you a bruise that even a Razor scooter could be envious of giving. Sometimes they were super fancy, making noise, having cool designs or flashing lights, things of that nature, for the cool kids of fourth grade. Time Magazine included it in their 100 Greatest Toys Ever and it's actually still available for purchase today, but considerably less common and less popular. The equivalent of psychedelic for a preteen was Lisa Frank items. Number three. Girls growing up in the 90s had access to what may be history's most vibrant and eclectic eras of fashion and baubles. Baby fat, the Delia's catalog, wet seal low rise jeans, and of course, Lisa Frank. Their endless products included everything from stickers and three ring binders to jewelry and clothing. All featured the iconic brand signature aesthetic of cute cuddly animals in bright colors and patterns amidst black color blocking. Lisa Frank herself was only 24 when she incorporated her name into into a franchise, and it's in the same year that she received its first million dollar order from Spencer's Gifts, aka she was a smash success from day one. Lisa Frank's popularity took a dip with the rise of digital era, the company receded into smaller collaborations and was mostly underground, but strongly resurged in the 2010s. Since there's been brand collabs with Crocs, Urban Outfitters, Blendjet, Morph Makeup, and even Pillsbury Sugar Cookies. If you've managed to hold on to some of your Lisa Frank items from childhood, you'd be surprised to know that some of them have gone up in value and are worth a pretty penny now. Number two is a trip to Orbit and the bathroom because this can't have been good for your stomach. This is for my Canadians. The 90s was a creative era for many things, especially beverages. Companies explored unforeseen parameters of flavor and aesthetics and so we see the Orbit soda, not soda beverage thing. It was a Canadian beverage and it was short lived, both coming out and being discontinued in the same year of 1997. It's a clear drink, clear craze things, that's chock full of 
sugar and had bright colored gelatin balls suspended and floating mysteriously. It was fruit flavored, but I'll be honest, these are the last flavors I expected to read when I was researching this product. Blackcurrant berry, blueberry, melon, strawberry, pineapple, banana, cherry, coconut, raspberry, citrus, and vanilla orange. That is intense. No wonder these drinks were short lived because of their overwhelming flavor combinations and weird floating orbs. Lava lamps are fun to look at, but no one wants to drink one. But if you do, hit eBay. You can still find unsealed Orbitz drinks there, running you an average of $50 a bottle. And number one is the Window Start Maze Screensaver. Ah, yes, the back rooms. Maybe this screensaver is why so many of us find a fascination with that concept. Anyways, if you had a desktop computer in or around the time of 1995 and 6, you're likely familiar with this endless maze screensaver. While the graphics may be painful to look at now, they were top notch visual at the time, like a 4D roller coaster. The default setting for the maze is a textured with brick walls and a wood floor and an asbestos tile ceiling. Users can customize these textures, swapping them out for animated psychedelic patterns in later versions, or maybe create their own custom textures. The walls are lined with art, some random plants, and statues. The maze is randomly generated each time with the player navigating it in first person, spawning in front of a floating start button. After starting, it automatically traverses using the right hand rule, which will guarantee the maze will eventually be solved because all randomly generated mazes are simply connected. 10 will be all about how one magic stone has a whole lot of uses. It's the Viking Sunstone. This stone was said to accurately pinpoint the position of the sun even through a cloudy, stormy, or twilight sky. To quote an explanation, when you're looking through the sunstone, you are not looking for colors but for shadows. If you draw a dot on the top of the crystal and look through it from the bottom, then two dots will appear. If you hold the crystal up to the sky and rotate the crystal until the two dots have the exact same intensity or darkness, at that angle, the upward facing surface indicates the direction of the sun. The oldest sunstone that could have been used for navigation was found among amongst a wreckage of a warship called the Alderney, which sank between England and France in 1592. Archaeologists made the assumption that this crystal was used for navigation because it was found about a meter away from another navigation tool. So in other words, speculations, because it could have been a paperweight for all we know. But it was in the Raouf's Pater, which is written in the 12th century, that's used to support the navigation theory. A story from King Olaf Haraldsson II, set in 1030 CE, tells how he was visited by a rich and wise farmer. Said farmer tells the king he mastered the skill where he can tell the time of day and night even when the sky is hidden by clouds, without a sunstone. And so to quote, the king made the people look out and they could nowhere see a clear sky. He then asked Sigurar, the farmer, to tell where the sun was at that time. He gave clear assertion. Then the king made them fetch a solar stone and held it up and saw where the light radiated from the stone and thus directly verified Sigurar's prediction. Guess two things were proven true in that text. A farmer has magic powers, and Vikings use sunstones. And while I'm still on the Vikings, may as well bring up number nine, another inexplicable invention of theirs, the Uberfelt swords. Ah, Scandinavian words. I feel like my tongue is just gonna jump out of my mouth and run away trying to say them sometimes. You ever been to Ikea and just read that stuff? Anyways, what makes these swords so inexplicable? We aren't sure how they're made. Listen to this. We'll be learning about Damascus steel in the next point, but it's believed the Scans may have borrowed this technique or even materials from the Damascus steel process in order to make their legendary swords. To quote, archaeologists were shocked when finding these Viking blades because the technology needed to produce such pure metal wouldn't be invented for another 800 years. What reaffirms archaeologists' belief that the steel pattern was not just mimicked but actually shared between the scans in the Middle East was a 9th century Viking grave that was found and excavated in 2014. Inscribed on the warrior's sword was 4 slash 2 Allah, written in Islam. This could be a massive link between the two worlds that confirms the sharing of knowledge, or at least a steel for steel trade. And as stated, Damascus steel is next on our countdown coming in at number 8. Some of y'all may have heard of this one by now, especially if you're a regular viewer on our channel. If so, lots of love, and if not, join the fam by subscribing to The Hive. But anyways, what is Damascus steel? Well, it's a very special type of metal that was being produced out of raw material, wood steel, which was harvested in Asia. It was first used around 300 BCE, but the knowledge seems to have been 
inexplicably lost around the mid-18th century. The secret of making the Middle East Damascus steel has only re-emerged under modern day scanning of electron microscopes. Turns out nanotechnology was heavily involved in Damascus steel production as the materials were added to the steel's production to create chemical reactions at a quantum level, as explained by the archaeology expert K. Chris Hurst. Alongside Peter Pulfer, it's stated that the metal developed a microstructure called carbide nanotubes, extremely hard tubes of carbon that are expressed on the surface and create the blade's hardness, Hurst explained. Materials added during the production of Damascus steel include cassia bark, milkweed, vanadium, chromium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, and some rare element traces which are presumably coming from mines in India. This may be why the Damascus steel recipe was lost, however, as Hurst wrote, what happened in the mid 18th century was that the chemical makeup of the raw material altered and the minute quantities of one or more minerals disappeared, perhaps because a particular load was exhausted somewhere in the world. Next up is a bit of an oddball, it's the Oxford Bell Batteries, number seven. And unlike most entries on this list, scientists could probably figure out how the Oxford Bell Batteries worked literally tomorrow if they tried. But why aren't they? Well, see, in order to do that experiment, they'd need to end another experiment, which is somehow inexplicably kept going for, hmm, yeah, over 180 plus years on accident? On accident. See, this bell has been ringing since 1840 when it was built by the London firm Watkins and Hill. They created two dry pile batteries to power the bell swing. Two batteries that should have died within weeks. Yet somehow these primitive batteries are still going, leading experts to realize their internal composition must be unique to have kept going on so strongly. Though scientists are desperate to figure out said composition, the bell is one of the oldest ongoing experiments in the world and to see what made it continue for so long means ending it prematurely, which is just too great of a cost. So I guess we're waiting for the battery to die, if it ever does. We've hit the mid video point, so I'm gonna talk about two points to you that the everyday person has definitely heard of. But what they haven't heard of is their history. So let's start with number six, the enema. That's right, as talked about in the recent video, top 10 dark secrets of the Maya civilization, enemas are quite literally as old as time itself. What is an enema? For my sweet summer children, that have somehow not been exposed to the literal down under of the medical world, an enema is a fluid injection in the back door for the purposes of clearing a bowel. However, cultures in pre-Columbian times and quite a few others did use it for ingesting substances to get a quicker effect. The earliest medical text in existence, Egyptian Ebers Papyrus of 1550 BCE, mentions the enema, which they believed was invented by the god Thoth. The Olmecs, who predated even the Mayans, used enemas for rituals as well as for disease, as did the Mayans, as documented during the colonial period, e.g. in the Florentine Codex. Heck, in Parisian society, they were doing enemas as many as three a day. Louis XIV was said to have taken over 2,000 in his lifetime. Enemas were known in ancient Samaria, Babylonia, India, Greece, and China. The indigenous of North America, even though far removed, independently discovered them as well. In fact, there's hardly a region in the world where people did not discover or adopt the enema. And as a result, we can't actually say who invented it first and who shared the information with who. It seems as a whole society collectively agreed we should put some stuff back there and see what comes out. The second one you've heard of, and I'd be worried if you didn't, is feminine hygiene, number five. People of the world had to find a solution for that once a month nightmare, and historically the creation of menstruation products has been dependent on geographical location, cultural attitudes towards menstruation, and available materials. Some examples are in the fifth century BC, a Greek physician and father of Western medicine, Hippocrates, wrote that in Greece, they used wool wrapped around wooden splints as tampons. As documented in the 10th century, however, they also fashioned wool into rags that they would simply fold and tuck. This information comes to us from the lovely story of a woman who is said to have thrown one of her used menstrual rags at an admirer in an attempt to get him to leave her alone. Ancient Egyptians are thought to have used papyrus fibers in a similar fashion to the Greek tampon. Their strategy was more like rolling a very tight scroll that would act as a cork, as papyrus isn't absorbent. Ancient Japan also used paper in a similar fashion. Some indigenous populations used grass mats, which women would sit upon in lodges meant for those who were menstruating. The naturally absorbent grass would just soak everything up. Another popular indigenous style in North America was buffalo skin or moss. And last but not least, in ancient Chinese culture, sand or dried grass was tightly packed and then wrapped in fabric before being used as a pad-like device for protection. Although ovular versions of this were made to be inserted in a tampon-like fashion. All in all, just like our last point, multiple cultures conjured up their own solutions for menstruation, and many of them were decomposable. It's not possible to know 
who made them first as a result, but it's quite obvious everyone had their own answers. Next up is an invention that Miss Busters couldn't even figure out. It's the heat ray number four. Greek mathematician Archimedes is one day sat down and dreamed big. And what he developed with that, from that was the heat ray weapon that defied, as mentioned, even the skills of Discovery Channel's Mythbusters to replicate in 2004. This weapon is quite simple. To quote, it's quite literally a ranks of polished bronze shields reflecting the sun rays at enemy ships. The ships were moored within the bow and arrow range, and according to legend, the Roman ships burned by the collective condensed sunlight shining from these mirrors. Ship after ship in the Roman fleet caught fire and sank into the Mediterranean. Although Mythbusters failed to reproduce this ancient weapon and declared it a myth, MIT students succeeded one year after the MB experiment in 2005. They actually managed to combust a boat in San Francisco Harbor. Sadly, the heat ray, if it did exist in the olden times, did not save Archimedes. The Roman soldiers eventually breached Syracuse's walls and despite orders from Claudius Marcellus that Archimedes not be harmed, one of the invaders killed him during the sack of the city. And the Sissimio scope is next up for number three, and it's the first earthquake detecting tool in history. Yet you wouldn't guess it by looking at this ornate, golden, dragon festooned, toad surrounded vessel from around 132 AD. The basic premise was as follows. When the Earth, well, quakes, one of the dragons, each representing principal directions of the compass, would spit out a bronze ball into the toad's mouth, indicating the direction of the quake. The instrument was said to have detected a 400 mile distance earthquake, which was not felt at the location of the device. But to this day, no one actually knows what's inside the artifact or how it works. If we want to find out, we'd have to quite literally break the thing, similar to the Oxford Bells. Some say it could have been a simple pendulum based system, but the exact science remains a mystery. Number two is the iconic Roman concrete. Why is it iconic? Stamina, baby. You can't even breathe near modern day pieces of cement without blowing a damn pothole in the thing. Yet the Colosseum still stands after what's essentially in my tiny brain a bajillion years. Why is that? Ash. Not as in it was like ashy, slap some lotion on it, but like actual volcanic ash. Researchers have worked in recent years to uncover the secret of this ancient concrete's longevity, and the secret was in front of their faces the whole time. An article published in 2013 by the University of California Berkeley News Center announced that the university researchers described for the first time how the extraordinary stable compound calcium aluminum cicate hydrate, abbreviated to just cash, binds the material. The process of making it would create a lower carbon dioxide emission than the process of making modern concrete. Some disadvantages of its use, however, is that it takes longer to dry, and although it lasts longer, it is weaker. Did the Romans add ash intentionally, recognizing, even without all the big sciencey words for it, that it added to the longer Activity, that's the next thing for scientists to crack. And now, last but never least, is number one, the flexible glass. Yeah, that's right, glass, but make it flexible. However, there are only three ancient accounts of the substance known as vertrum flexil, and they don't make it exactly clear enough to determine if the substance really existed. The story of its invention was first told by Petronius in 63 AD. He wrote about a glassmaker who presented the Emperor Tiberius, who reigned from 14 to 37 AD, with a glass vessel. He asked the Emperor to hand it back to him at which point the glassmaker, to the shock of the king's court, threw it at the floor. Everyone expected to hear a shatter, but it didn't break. The strange glass only dented, which the glassmaker hammered back into shape quickly. So what did the emperor do to award this amazing god sent invention? Completely panic, apparently. Fearing the devaluation of precious metals, Tiberius literally ordered the inventor be beheaded, so the secret died with him. Pliny the Elder of 79 AD told this story as well, but he also said that although the story was frequently told, it may not be entirely true. The version told a couple hundred years later by Dio Cassius morphed the glassmaker into some sort of magician. And when the vessel was thrown at the floor, it did break, but the glassmaker just magicked it back together. In 2012, the glass manufacturing company Corning introduced its flexible willow glass. Heat resistant and flexible enough to be rolled up, it's proven especially useful in making solar panels. But if that unfortunate Roman glassmaker did indeed invent Bichron Flexel, then he was thousands and thousands of years ahead of his time. Number 10, the Slugbot. Kind of recent, but we'll go back. We'll go back to the ancient days. The 2021 Slugbot is a robotic device that was created by researchers at the California Institute of 
technology. And this robot is designed not to help you with your homework, but instead help farmers manage crops without harmful pesticides. Pretty good, right? No more helicopters dropping random sprays on you. That's always fun. The slug bot uses artificial intelligence, a little scary, but here we go, it uses AI to detect and identify pests such as slugs and it applies a targeted non-toxic solution to then, um, well, eliminate them. Little slug terminators going back in time to get rid of pests and problems. Love that. The device moves autonomously through the fields, navigating itself around plants and obstacles, and operates quietly to avoid disturbing wildlife. That's awesome. A quiet robotic slug is somewhere out there. Watch your step. Just, you know, be light on the toes. Number nine, the BitBite. The BitBite is a, well, it's technology designed to improve eating habits and promote a healthier lifestyle. Again, I'm not sure I'm gonna use this one. I like just eating chips without any voice in my head telling me to stop. That's how I like them. Dill pickle, see you later. It's a small wearable device that clips onto your earlobe and it monitors eating behaviors in real time. It tracks the number of bites, the speed of your eating, and the duration of meals, providing instant feedback and coaching, coaching you right there in your earlobe to encourage mindful eating habits. So while you're eating, it'll be like, slow down. And you're like, well, Good call, thank you Siri, that's good. BitBite also integrates with a mobile app, of course, right, you gotta connect it all, which allows users to set personalized goals, track your progress, and receive personalized recommendations based on your eating patterns. You look down today, he's like, I think it's burger day, I think it's definitely a burger day. With its advanced sensors and AI algorithms, BitBite has the potential to revolutionize the way that we approach nutrition and healthy eating, without it being, you know, boring and all charts and labels and stuff. Now it's just a voice, a literal voice in your ear, telling you, don't eat that. Well, you don't need sour keys today. Let it go. Number eight, ornithopter. This one's good. This one's from Dune. It's the thing that goes really loud in IMAX. It's so good. The ornithopter is very real. And not as cool as in the movie Dune, but it was something. It was a type of aircraft that uses flapping wings to generate lift and propulsion almost like a dragonfly. The concept of an ornithopter has been around since ancient times, but the first manned flight of a powered ornithopter was back in 1963. It's weird, I have a dragonfly tattoo that says 1963 on it. I'm like, yeah, I was there, I saw the whole thing. I was one of them. This historic flight was achieved by Dr. Paul McCready. He was an American engineer and inventor at the time. Now his ornithopter, God, I, wish I wish I had one now. His ornithopter, called the Gossamer Condor, this one had a wingspan of 96 feet and it was powered by pedaling a bicycle-like mechanism. You'd have to go quite fast if you wanted to get up there. Great for the legs, good leg day workout. The Gossamer Condor flew for a distance of 1,163 meters, reaching an altitude of 15 feet. That is amazing. The right bros are like, uh, we can't beat that, but we'll try. We'll definitely try. Number seven, newspapers. We still have newspapers around. We still have some people hucking them on your doorstep, I guess, if that's still a thing. I haven't seen that in a bit. I feel like we're on the last leg with newspapers. You know what I mean? They had a decent run though, okay? To be fair, they've been around for a while. What do they got, 131 BC to wherever iPhones were invented? That's not a bad go. That's not bad at all. 131 BC to iPhones. That's not a bad run. That's pretty good. In ancient times, daily acts and events, they were often recorded and disseminated through newspapers known as Acta Dierna or Daily Acts, also known as newspapers. These newspapers were introduced during the Roman Empire around 131 BC, and it contained news and accounts of daily events, such as public speeches, trials, and ideally, military victories. The newspapers were written in Latin, and they were posted in public places for citizens to read. They were an important source of information for citizens in Rome. In fact, they were the only form of communication back then, so it was important. It was like an audition, as soon as uh, the list goes up, as soon as that paper's posted, everyone rushes over to take a look. What happened? Who died? Who was it? The tradition of daily newspapers, of course, continued in various forms throughout history, eventually evolving into our modern day newspaper industry. Or now I just go, oh, what's, what's on Twitter? This person died. Nice, that's sad. Number six, electric light bulbs. This one here, yeah, it's a bit important, I guess. Without light bulbs, well, you wouldn't be able to see my pale Victorian era complexion right now. But now we got a thousand, so you can see every imperfection on my face. But thanks to Humphrey Davy, the world is a little brighter with electric light bulbs. Humphrey Davy was a British chemist and he was famous, of course, for inventing the very first electric light in 1802. He created a battery powered arc lamp, which consisted of two charcoal rods that were connected to a battery and then brought close together to produce this, well, light. This first ever electric art that changed history. This arc produced a bright light that could be sustained for several hours, which today would suck, but back then that's game changing. Although Davy's electric light was not practical for widespread use yet due to its high cost and short lifespan, it was still a significant step towards lighting technology and 
where we are now in the future and it paved the way for further research and development in this field. Again, pretty important. Davy's invention also had a profound impact on other areas such as electrical power generation and distribution. So now we have clap on, clap off lights. That's crazy. If you could only see that, that, that was his dream. He wanted an electric arc and then he wanted to clap it off. He's like, yes, I've done it. Number five, transistors. The invention of the transistor in 1947, this, we don't talk about it enough. This was a major breakthrough in the field of electronics. The transistor is a semiconductor device that can amplify and switch electronic signals. And this of course paved the way for the development of modern electronics, including computers, televisions, radios, this thing that I'm talking to you on, all of that good stuff. The invention of the transistor was made by a team of scientists at Bell Laboratories, led by William Shockley. William Shockley, he's like, oh, trust me, I have to. I have to do this profession. The first transistor was made using germanium and it was much smaller and much more efficient than the vacuum tubes that were used at the time. Yeah, believe it or not, this was a step in the right direction. This was the future. I'm looking up research about transistors while using a computer. What a weird era we're in right now. Humans are... It was a weird time. Number four, the Parthian Empire battery. The Parthian battery is an ancient artifact discovered in modern day Iraq. This battery dates back to the first century BCE. Yeah, year one, uno, just one. Happy new year. It's been one of them. The battery itself is a clay jar containing a copper cylinder that surrounds a big iron rod. Looks quite unsafe, if I'm being honest. I don't know, if I saw that on the subway, I'd probably knock it on, a little sketchy. The jar also contains an asphalt stopper and an electrolyte solution, and it's believed to have been made of vinegar or wine. So that was their power back then. Although the purpose of the battery is not entirely clear, it's speculated that it may have been used for electroplating or, check this out, or for medical purposes. Yeah, medical purposes. Imagine being brought back to life thousands of years ago, and there's a guy holding this waiting in front of you. That's jarring, you're like, did I die in my back? What is that, what are you holding? The Parthian Empire battery is proof that we didn't need aliens back then to do stuff, right? Humans were more advanced than we think. Specifically humans from ancient civilizations. They somehow figured this out. They had knowledge of electricity and electrochemistry in the year one, one AD, that's crazy. This invention challenges the commonly held belief that modern science and technology are recent developments. It's like, no, they had some shit back then for sure. Number three, vaccines. Plagues aren't new, random diseases that can sweep an entire country. We've seen this play out many times in history. The Black Death killed 75 to 200 million people in the 14th century. The Spanish flu in 1918, it killed one third of the world's population, 50 million lives. The cholera pandemic began in 1817 and in 2010, there was another outbreak in Haiti. Couldn't get worse. Vaccines are a little important. Yeah, they go back to the 17th century when English physician Edward Jenner developed a method to protect against smallpox. Now this was performed by injecting people with cowpox which was a less severe disease. The practice of vaccination gradually spread throughout Europe and by the 19th century, thankfully, vaccines are being developed for a range of diseases, including polio, measles, and tetanus. Those three things you really don't want at any point in your life. Vaccines have played a crucial role in preventing infectious diseases and have saved countless lives. However, there's also been a controversy surrounding their use, particularly in recent years with the rise of anti-vaccine movements. Yeah, a lot of people with Sharpies in time today. You didn't have that back in the dark ages. Bristol board wasn't a thing back then, you know? Number two, ancient telescope. Ah uh, yes, let's see some stuff, let's see the past. The Nimrod lens, this is a 3,000 year old rock crystal lens that was discovered, again, in modern day Iraq. It was discovered in the mid 1800s. Just an ancient relic, just an ancient telescope, fresh out of Zelda, there we go. Today we have the James Webb Space Telescope, but 3,000 years ago, they were more advanced than we thought. The lens is believed to have been made by a Syrian craftsman sometime around 750 BC, and it's the oldest known example of a magnifying lens. Up until then, everybody was squinting a lot, kind of like how I do with the prompter sometimes. You'll see, I'm like, ooh. The lens is quite small in size. It's about three centimeters in diameter, not much. And its focal length was only 12 centimeters. Again, it's no James Webb, but back then, thousands of years ago, it was something. Now, the exact purpose of the Nimrod lens is still up for debate, but it's thought to have been used for decorative or ceremonial purposes, or possibly as a magnifying glass for studying small objects. The Nimrod lens is the first example of ancient optical technology. So small. He's like, ah, yes. It's a moon. Number one, the printing press. Look, I'm no fan of homework, okay? But I get it, it's important, you gotta do it. The printing press, this is a revolutionary invention and it was invented during the medieval period and it allowed for the mass production of books and or pamphlets. Yeah, pamphlets were huge back in medieval times. 
It looked folding. Invented by Johannes Gutenberg in the mid 15th century, the printing press could now reproduce text more quickly, and it was pretty cheap considering what came before. You had to hire a guy just to rewrite everything. That's gonna take ages, and it did quite a few fortnights. The printing press had quite the impact on society. It enabled wider access to knowledge, the spread of ideas, and it contributed to the growth of literacy, which I guess I could use a little bit of today. That's great. The printing press played a key role in the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation, and it may or may not have helped lay the foundation for the modern world. And I think it's probably the most important thing. I think words and ideas being spread, that's probably the most important thing. Don't you think so? Number 10, the National Razor. What's a revolution without a little blood being spread? Built. Would really be a revolution, would it? France was having a hard time in the 1700s, so they needed a brand new way to get rid of pesky monarchs and anyone who isn't warming up to the revolutionary ideals. And what better way to keep people warm by cleaving their heads from their body? A man named Joseph Ignaz Guillotine suggested that there was a better method for unaliving those who needed to be unalived. A common misconception is that he invented the guillotine, but rather suggested its implementation, where his name would become synonymous with such a terrible terrible device. Basically, you got a wood frame with a hole for your noggin and a large angled blade. Blade drops down from frame and removes the head of state from the governing body. Which isn't just a clever joke, as that's what happened to the last king and queen of France. By the time of its invention and the end of its use all the way up into the 1970s, yes, that's right, it was used up until the 70s, thousands of people met their doom to the National Razor. Number 9. Party Favors in the Sky When you think of air travel today, you think of lots of space for you and your fellow passengers, meals that are flavorful and affordable. Air travel in 2021 is a stress-free, very organized way to travel. But in the 1700s, these luxuries of the sky were non-existent, as there was no air travel. Any international travel was done by ship, which took months at a time and was not a pleasurable experience, opposite to what was described above. Two French brothers wanted to change this, or rather just get off the ground. The two French brothers, Montegolfier, developed and flew the first unmanned hot air balloon on September 19, 1783. This was shortly followed up with a manned flight by Jean-Francois Pilate de Rosier. This was a very strange invention of the time, as this was really the beginning of humans and flying. Number 8. Puckle needs his gun. Ever since black powder first made it to Europe and Europeans figured out you could make big gun that go boom, people have been trying to come up with better and faster ways to make gun go boom. In the 1700s, the biggest issue with muskets and cannons at the time was reloading or getting multiple shots off. Loading black powder weapons isn't easy. I'd say ask a pirate, but you can't. Those, those kind of pirates are all, all gone now. So to fix the issue of the day, a man named James Puckle invented the very cleverly named Puckle Gun. Basically, he just added more chambers of shot rotating around one barrel. Although his idea for the time was genius, in practice it wasn't very effective, as flintlock and black powder are really the main issue. Clumsy, lots of smoke, and does not want to work in less than fair weather conditions. Number 7. Cotton Eye Joe Dear YouTube Gods, I am sorry that history is full of not so cool things, but here at Bumblebee, I'm the Queen Bee, and I'm here to give the buzz to my sweet honeybees. So in the name of good morals, monetization, and not getting smited, I'm going to talk about your least favorite S word. Back in the 1700s, America was chillin'. They just beat Britain in a war, which alone could be its own video. They were starting to build their own country, particularly in these southern colonies using forced unpaid labor that you can't leave. Oh, and your boss can do heinous things to you because uh, he owns you. Their economy was agricultural based and stayed that way for a long time. Tobacco being the number one crop at first, cotton was still grown but wasn't as popular due to the processing of cotton being a very labor intensive and difficult process. This was until Eli Whitney's cotton gin invented in 1794. The cotton gin was a machine that quickly removed seeds and processed cotton, making cotton a very valuable crop since, you know, the people harvesting the cotton are YouTube's least favorite S word. It's a, it's a brutal unpaid workforce. Now that it was profitable, cotton boomed and the South became very wealthy. While not exactly the main reason, the South getting rich off Whitney's design and did somewhat create a divide between the southern states and the northern states, eventually leading to the Civil War. Also, apparently plantation owners didn't pay Eli for his machine and he went broke. Just trashy behavior all around, man, come on. Number 6. Yes, I'm a Russian submarine commander. I actually couldn't believe this one myself, but 
the submarine was invented in the 1700s. Having designs and plans started in the 1500s, the first real use of a submersible vessel wasn't until 1775, named the Turtle, an acorn-shaped vessel with a crew of just one. To me, it's just hard to think that in the same century we were beginning to master flight and sea travel. I also can't stop thinking that if there was a water ride that existed, it would be pretty cool if you went underwater in like a pod, like a submarine kind of thing. Just an idea for the mouse and the corporation. Of course, it wouldn't be years until after the turtle that the submarine would see effective use. Or have a Scottish man play a Russian submarine commander in a really good movie. Russian submarine commander. Number 5. Dawn of the Punch Guard With the Industrial Revolution on the horizon, many things were about to change. Probably the most obvious at the time was factories. While not the first, Richard Arkwright's Cromford Mill in 1771 is what most resembles a modern factory today. Cromford Mill was the first water-powered cotton spinning mill and initially employed 200 workers. It ran day and night with two 12-hour work shifts, the gates being locked at 6am and 6pm, permitting no late arrivals. Oh, he likes to keep a tight schedule. Yeah, I can see the beginnings of a modern factory, all right. All you're missing is Bezos and a couple of drones to make it modern. All jokes aside, though, uh, these early factories changed the very fabric of not only Britain, but also the world. I mean, where would we be today with all that lovely pollution and those great and fair working conditions? I, I, I bet there was benefits, too. Number four, the golden liquid. You drink liquid and then it's gonna come out of you. It's simple, it's science. But sometimes other fluids need to be drained. Sometimes you can have difficulty using the little boys room. Personally, I'm still learning how to put down the toilet seat. I haven't quite figured that one out. How to make pee when a person cannot pee. Portly founding father Benjamin Franklin thought to himself as he was holding a kite in the rain. This is something I learned, which I didn't know, is that he invented the flexible catheter. Yep. Next time you feel a little weird because a tube is being inserted into a sensitive area, you can thank the man on the $100 bill. Invented in 1752 in order to aid his brother with bladder stones. It's strange though, you know, you think of a guy inventing other things, but in reality, it's a really important invention and something that's very common in the medical world today. I just hope to stay healthy long enough so no tube has to go near my founding father. Number three, pseudo cool. Okay, so back in the 1700s, food was really hard to keep. For example, meat is packed with a salty brine in order to preserve it. It either has to be shipped overseas or last long enough through a cold and brutal winter. But plans for refrigeration were being drawn up, specifically the idea of vapor compression refrigeration. Not exactly the fridge that's in your kitchen today, considering there's you know, still no main harnessing of electricity, which makes fridges run, but a brilliant idea nonetheless. While the fridge we know was still far away, it's crazy to think in the 1700s we had serious plans for one. While this was being developed, food was kept near lakes and snows in the winter. Runoffs from mountains were often used to keep drinks cool. I think this is something we all take for granted. I mean, can you imagine drinking room temperature milk or having a beef dinner that tastes saltier than salt? Looking back through history, it's interesting to see how humans persevere. As much as I love food, I don't know if I could stomach food from the past. Thank goodness we don't eat anything gross today. Hey man, uh, do you have any canned cheese left? I'm kind of hungry. Number two, ebony, ivory, living together in harmony. I honestly thought this one was older than the 1700s, but hey, here we are, invented in the year 1700 by a musically inclined Italian gentleman named Bartolomeo Cristofori. Unhappy with what was going on at the time, he decided to spice it up by changing out a few parts of some common instruments and started using little hammers that strike quickly on chords and come back in hopes they would not dampen the sound. A little fine tuning here and there and bada bing bada boom, you got a piano. I would attempt to make a joke about the piano, but let's be honest, no piano, no Elton John. No jazz, no Frank Sinatra. If you're asking me, that's a big problem. Number one, ABCs. As someone who struggles with reading, this one makes me want to hide under my covers at night. I spent countless hours as a kid learning to read and oh, Man, the phonics lessons were brutal. And thanks to this invention, I can blame it all on the 1755 invention, the English Dictionary. Yep, that's right. One of the most influential, too. Written by Samuel Johnson, it took seven years to compile all the words I can't pronounce. He was commissioned 1,500 guineas for the project, which is worth about 250,000 pounds today. Until the completion of the Oxford Dictionary 173 years later, Johnson's Dictionary is considered to be the preeminent English dictionary and a huge achievement in scholarship. I mean, you gotta give the guy credit for writing this. Imagine writing an English essay for seven years. But then again, 250,000 pounds for some of my writing also sounds pretty good. All I have to do now is learn to read. 
and right. Number 10, the bullet mouse trap. You might have heard me say that and said, what? Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mouse trap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mouse trap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mouse trap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mouse trap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of, do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse, after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9. T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8. Nightmare Story I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, Dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. Ah, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll-like automaton that had clock-like gears to simulate real human movement. With the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self-defense. Or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for a woman to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item, a flask. Number 6. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst, you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah, and they're cooler than me. Oh, Yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens, but they actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number 5. I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins. A truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead. Now you are being buried alive. 
Have no fear, friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs, which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time, with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number four. Your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh, to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No, sir! This is the age of machines. And if machines can help with one thing, it most certainly can aid in another. May I introduce you the rotary hairbrush? Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you? At the time, it kind of made sense. Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate, everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk, anyone? Number three, full of air. The Industrial Revolution changed the world. We can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic power trains? Back in the 1800s, a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air power train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the Western Tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly, the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that houses his short train the tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number two, get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but Mon thinks I play too many games. Designed by FR Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off-road terrain, instead to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number one. Bro, trust me. Everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey. But back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without. The cholera belt. What does a cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately, man. I totally need just to cleanse that space, bro. Number 10, Game Boy Shoes. I'm not the most fashionable guy on the planet. I'm just a simple guy who likes simple things. So you can understand my shock, my horror, and my confusion when I saw the Game Boy Shoes. Yes, that's right. Remember the Game Boy? Picking a starter Pokemon for the first time. That was a really serious choice. The very same portable console that changed your childhood could now sit snug as a bug in your platform shoe. I have several issues with this. One, can someone send me a working Game Boy? I miss those games, man. Come on, those are, those are really cool. I want one. Number two, it just looks ugly. No shot, you roll up to somebody's house with those bad boys and they go, yeah, you're cool, dude. You look great. You don't. Number three, maybe this is fine to wear in sunny California, but in Canada, the Game Boy would spend most of its time in snow or puddles. I couldn't do that to such a beautiful piece of gaming history. I would never forgive myself. Number nine, 
Are you winning, son? Is something your dad and every dad has said when checking on their kid playing games on a Sunday afternoon. Naturally, not knowing what a video game is or what a Pikachu does is just part of being a dad. However, next time dad decides to go on one of his fishing trips, you should surprise him with the Game Boy Fish Finder. Yeah, I know, another Game Boy gadget, but I had to. Every dad says they caught the big one, and they're not talking about your mom. But now dad can see them coming. Imagine spending hours in the summer sun on a lake with your dad, and the only thing that was distracting you from his developing drinking issue is now being used to find fish. But sometimes Nintendo likes to do weird stuff. Remember when the Wii came out? It was just it was kind of weird. Loved it though. But a fish finder? This is only something a 90s fever dream could come up with. I, I'm just not sure about that one. Number 8. Floppy Disks Going with a lot of tech today, but stuff like this defined the later half of the century. Why are floppy disks on this list? Well, because it was arguably just as important as the PCs that revolutionized computers. And it's silly to think that how storage that small was so useful. Storage on floppy disks varied from different models over the years, but for an example, one model held 1.44 megabytes. Today in 2022, we are arguably in the beginning of the terabyte era. Now, try putting more than 5 AAA games on your Xbox, am I right? Gigabytes just aren't enough anymore. Now, if you crunch some numbers, a 1 terabyte flash drive has over 1 million MG, which, if we do even more math, is just under 700,000 floppy disks to our modern equivalent. The math is a little rough, but my point is clear. We've come a long way. Well, turns out that they were still somewhat being used up until 2019. That's, I know, that's what I said. The US and whatever mysterious forces are in charge of nuclear weapons were still using them up until 2019. I feel like that's the wrong thing to put in charge of nuclear weapons. A floppy disk for nukes? That just feels like a bad idea. Number seven, Dial P for Palpatine. <laughs> I just wanted to give you guys some more Palpatine. I think you guys really like it. But something that I don't know if our viewers experienced, but let us know if you did. This is kind of interesting actually, but the creation of 911. Honestly, what do people do before that? Pick up the phone and like, operator, help, help, my house is on fire. Okay, sir, hold on, we'll just connect to you. Uh, okay, thanks. This is the fire department. Help, help, my house is on fire. Well, thanks to the totally non-corrupt and fairly priced AT&T, a nationwide number was decided to be the best for dialing emergencies and not waiting for an operator or any other option like screaming for help. A senator made the first 911 call on February 16th, 1968, which sounds like a long time ago and it is, but it also kinda isn't. I don't know, that's kinda weird. Number six, I am the destroyer of worlds. I mean, this is kind of a big one, literally. It's the reason why there hasn't been a World War III since, or why there will never be a World War IV, because there would just be nothing left. What am I talking about, of course? Jello mold foods. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about nuclear weapons with the capabilities to wipe out an entire city with the flip of a button. Part of the super secret Manhattan project, the goal was to make a weapon so destructive that whoever was unfortunate enough to catch a case of the super weapon would surrender immediately. Japan would unfortunately be on the receiving side of this, and shortly thereafter surrendered World War II. Imagine though, the power to level an entire city in just a few seconds. It's something unthinkable just a few years before. Some might even call it an act of biblical proportions. And you wouldn't be that far off either. Number 5. Only Us Humans Human beings, smart, intelligent, loving creatures, right? Well, the ones I like to be around are, and I hope the ones around you are too. Okay, where am I going with this? Well, I think we can all agree that war sucks, right? Look at Ukraine and Russia right now. What I think a lot of people don't think about is war logistics, what goes into a war effort. Every bootstrap, backpack, and bullet fired has to be counted and shipped. The weirdest thing, or perhaps the worst thing that we've done is mass produce small arms. The Avdamat Kalashnikov needs no introduction. You've seen it in movies, games, and all over the news in the last 60 years. An effective, cheap, and reliable tool that's the backbone of insurrections across the world and probably will be for many years to come. The point I'm trying to make is that we can create and make such beautiful things, but so much time has gone into destroying one another. Kalashnikov is unfortunately really good at doing that. In some black markets of the third world countries, they go for as little as $100 US. It is estimated that of every firearm ever made, one in five is a Kalashnikov. Number four, I wanted one. It should come as no surprise that my persona is that of a lumberjack. I like relaxing after a long day. I'm big and I like beer. That's how it goes. While certainly not the manliest man, you never find me at a My Little Pony convention. 
I'm just not going there. Where am I going with this? Well, if you were a young girl growing up, there's a chance you had an Easy Bake Oven. Yes, that's right. I, Big Jed, wanted an Easy Bake Oven. But as a young man, I was embarrassed to have pink. I mean, come on, I can't have pink. It's, it's pink. Even though now I'd be totally fine with pink. I, like, I, I, like, I like pink cards, I think they look cool. I was a tubby kid and just wanted some brownies with icing. Can you blame me? No, you can't. However, there is something about giving your kid a little oven that's, well, strange. There's no way I should have been given anything sharp, let alone an oven. Yes, I know they're pretty safe, but still, it's a weird concept. And weird thing to bring up in the boardroom for an idea. Guy walks in the room and he's like, kids, ovens. Fires, put them together, what do you got? Million dollar idea, let's go. Number three, didn't sell very well, boy. I doubt many people would remember this, and in Nintendo's defense, they usually know what they're doing, sometimes. I know I'm talking about gaming stuff again, but besides making you guys laugh, it's like the only other passion I have, man. The Virtual Boy, I wouldn't expect many to have seen it since the sales were so poor since the console was so poor. The Virtual Boy was a 32-bit portable console that was basically a headset, except, you know, there's no straps to put it on your head, but a stand so you can play games while you sit or while you're prone? I guess that would've been cool if there was like a sniper game or something, but for classic Nintendo side-scrolling action, it doesn't really make any sense. The main selling point was the graphics. The Virtual Boy was capable of 3D, which was huge for the time, except it was stereographic 3D and monochrome red, Watching footage of the gameplay gives me a headache just looking at it, so I can see why laying down on your living room floor for a while, playing it, would just suck. It just wouldn't be good. Number two, Electronic Cafe. This is going to sound weird to anyone born after 1995, but there used to be internet cafes. Yeah, I know, there's some that still exist, but it's just a weird concept. Hi, come on in, where you can order a coffee and browse the World Wide Web with your sticky keys. And that's not because of a typo. There's just something about sharing a PC with the whole city that rubs me the wrong way. Because I know for a fact there's some dudes in there who are rubbing themselves the wrong way in the cafe. In the 90s when PCs were becoming a mainstay in homes and offices, some folks just didn't have one yet. Or if they did, had full access to the internet. Do you remember the dial-up sound? Ooh, sound of nightmares. So coming to a place to access such modern technology made sense in the 1990s and even the early 2000s. However, in 2022, when everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket, not so much. Smartphones are really cool. It's, it's actually pretty cool technology. Number one, the infomercial king. Not the first to do it and won't be the last, but he may be the best. As a kid growing up in the late 90s, watching TV on a Sunday afternoon made a few things certain. I was going to have my snackies and juice. I was going to ponder what a house hippo was. I was going to be yelled at by a man with enough charisma to use OxyClean. Yes, the famous infomercial featuring the late Billy Mays. There was just something charming about his performance that made you want to clean stains easily. Infomercials are a way to shove products down your throat. Call now, but wait, there's more. Three easy payments of $19.99. Sell, sell, sell. With infomercials, they aren't just selling you a product. They are selling the infomercial themselves. It just wouldn't be as effective if the ShamWow guy wasn't weird about his peanuts on ice cream. That's just how it goes. Number 10, steel cage match, brother. Okay, so it's the early 1900s and you're living in a rapidly growing city. Towers are popping up everywhere and that means that there's less space for you and your baby to play in. Only if there was a way my baby could get fresh air and sunshine. Meet the baby cage, yeah. A small metal cage with a tiny mattress for your baby. The said metal cage is suspended on your windowsill, making the baby spend multiple stories above ground level. This, this is just a great idea. The idea behind this terrible idea was that the babies need fresh air and sunshine. Providing them with such was thought to improve their immune system and make them healthier. Besides the fact that the only thing separating your baby from becoming the worst rainfall event of the month was a thin metal cage. This is a prime example of why every product should be thoroughly tested and thought about before selling. Eventually, these did fall out of fashion, but in reality this wasn't that long ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Number 9. Nuclear Time A lot happened in the 1900s. I mean, a lot. Couple wars here and there, the TV, the car. It was a busy century. A century full of discovery and invention. One such unusual invention was the radium dial. Watches and clocks that were painted with luminescent paint, making the numbers and dials glow in the dark. Trouble with this new invention was the paint being used wasn't exactly safe, as it was made from radium. 
For the Breaking Bad nerds at home, radium is a highly radioactive element, even more so than the legendary uranium. So when a factory of women eager to get to work were told they were going to be painting watches with radioactive paint, do you think anyone asked for PPE? Truth be told, not everything was known about radium as it was only recently discovered. But what's so unusual is what factories told these women how to paint the watches. In order to give the brushes a fine tip, the women were instructed to use their lips to keep the brushes in perfect order, not knowing that day after day they were ingesting a very radioactive element. And in some sense of dark comedy, they sometimes had fun and painted their nails and on each other. I mean, it glowed in the dark. It was glow in the dark paint. It was new. It was cool. Over 50 women would become very sick from painting, and 12 sadly lost their lives. Number eight, I'm ready for my close up. Ladies, this one's for you. In this day and age with social media, loving your self image can be tough. There's tons of things that makeup companies and media do to make you want to be the people they want you to be. If you buy said product, of course. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need all that. You're gorgeous just the way you are, and lately, honey, you've been slaying it. However, this marketing manipulation isn't new, and in the past, most certainly wasn't very subtle. Introducing the Beauty Micrometer, the latest from How to Horrify People Daily. It was actually invented by the famed beautician Max Factor Sr. Hell of a name. This steel KG device was placed over a poor woman's head to then mathematically calculate the flaws that would be adjusted using makeup products. Obviously, these are no longer around and for good reason. I, I, I don't even have a joke for that one. That's just weird. Number seven, back to the future. During the technological boom of electronics in the 1980s, there was one invention I think is really unusual. Computers, camcorders, and even home video game consoles were becoming commonplace all over the world. People who are familiar with retro Nintendo consoles are familiar with the likes of Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, or Contra. You may even remember a certain gaming accessory involving a laughing dog every time you miss a duck. What 80s kids might not remember is the Konami Laser Scope. Similar to Nintendo's Zapper, but with two key differences. One, it's a headset instead of a pistol. Two, it's voice controlled, meaning when you come across enemies in game, you have to shout fire to fire in game. The Konami laser scope was bold and tried to be ahead of its time, but when taking a good look at it, one, it makes the user just look ridiculous, and two, it doesn't work. Reviews for the headset are not favorable and just defeat the purpose of using a headset. Today we have VR headsets that may seem just as ridiculous, but they work, and the use of voice still isn't a primary control used in games today. Number six, Battleship Woodchip. This is one of my favorites. Okay, hear me out for this one. Back in the 1940s, there was a really super, not very fun, expensive war happening. Germany, Japan, and Italy needed to go into the timeout corner. But after a while of people trying to put each other in the timeout corner, things were getting super expensive. World War II was fought on all fronts, land, sea, and air. The sea being a key part of the war victory in the beginning of the war. Literally tons of war goods and ships were being sunk by German U-boats every day across the Atlantic. So in order to cut costs, what if the ships were built out of something cheaper, but just as tough as steel? Concrete, right? Nope, I bet you weren't thinking ice. Or more specifically, sawdust and ice mixed to form piecrete. Testing with Pycrete had gone so well that in a super secret general meeting, Pycrete was presented, shot at in the meeting, ricocheting a bullet causing another general a flesh wound. Having its defense capabilities proven in the war room, Operation Habakkuk was greenlit and the Allies were planning on constructing an aircraft carrier made out of ice and sawdust to help thwart the German U-boats. However, this was scrapped, as a boat made of sawdust and ice would really not be much help against a German U-boat. Plus. Where do you sleep? Can you cook on there? Way more questions than answers. Number five. Hello there. Channeling our inner General Grievous, our number five spot belongs to the monowheel. Originally designed in the 19th century, it wasn't until the 20th century they slapped a motor on one of these bad boys and did their best escape attempt from Utapau. Sorry, I'm a Star Wars guy. It just looks like the vehicle from the third movie. I can't help myself. In reality, the monocycle is a single wheeled motorized vehicle where the driver either sits inside the wheel housing or right beside it. Today, these vehicles are still around but really only used for entertainment purposes, as the design does have a few issues. One wheel gives balance issues, there's a visibility issue since, well, you know, you're usually sitting inside the wheel, and an issue called gerbling, which basically means if the driver brakes too hard, the inner ring will overcome its own gravity and the driver will do a full loop, similar to how a gerbil spins around on its wheel. 
Seeing that would make Monday morning traffic a lot more amusing though, I gotta say. Number 4. Deep breath my equine friend. World War 1 was the war to end all wars, except for the 10 major wars that came after it. Noted for being the bloodiest and most destructive conflict at the time, it gave humanity a bunch of cool and exciting inventions, so long as they were not being used on you. One of the worst things to come out of the first world war was the extensive use of trench warfare and chemical weapons, or more specifically chlorine gas. Trench warfare was brutal, not only in its barbaric over the top charges into machine gun fire, but also in its living. Trenches had terrible living conditions, and were difficult to take from the enemy. Crossing no man's land was no joke. So to eliminate the pesky enemies entrenched in their trenches, the very cruel chlorine gas was used, causing nausea, violent coughing, chest pain, and corneal burns, just about everything you'd find on the back of normal medication, right? Gas masks helped when they were available, but unfortunately they were not the only living creatures on the battlefield. This is where our invention comes in. The very depressing invention of the horse gas mask. The idea is the same. Horses need protection too, and since World War I was still a war powered by horses, it was more common than you might think. And a lot of our equine friends perished alongside us. Number 3. Wilson! Some of you may have been cool enough back in 1975 to own a pet rock. Some of you may have not. Looking back, it doesn't really make any sense. Sure, everyone needs something to keep them company. Tom Hanks would have never gotten off the island he was stranded on if it wasn't for Wilson. Imagine a world without Tom Hanks. I, for one, would not want to live in such a world. All jokes aside, the Pet Rock was a genius marketing campaign, very similar to the fidget spinner of recent years. It's proof that if you can get a fad trade rolling, you can sell anything. Now, who wants some of my bath water? Number two, Chef's Kiss. Okay, it's 1958. Times are good. Cars have cool fins on them. Elvis is on the radio, and most of my post traumatic stress disorder has cleared up since the war was over. It's all great. Ah, yes, life is good. I can't wait to enjoy some modern cuisine. Well, let's see what's on the menu. I'll have to start with the frozen cheese salad. I'll have ham and banana hollandaise. And for dessert, I'll have the lime jello tuna pie. If that doesn't sound appetizing, I don't know what does. For some reason, halfway through the century, people just lost their taste buds. They were coming out with all kinds of disgusting foods. A lot of them are in low form for some strange reason. I think the grossest item that you can come across is a little invention called Hongar. Sounds like somebody from Skyrim, but nay good sir. Hongar is a mixture of honey and apple cider vinegar. It was thought to provide great health benefits. The only thing that would give me is a spot in front of the toilet refunding my breakfast. Ugh. Number one, Krümelauf. Germany was having a really hard time in World War II. The United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, France, and Russia too were all coming to give the mustache man a piece of their mind. Heavily outnumbered, it was time for a miracle. Time to see what top German scientists had up their sleeve. We have a rifle that can shoot around the corners. Isn't it wunderbar? Yeah, this thing is real. A curved barrel called a Krumlauf, used for shooting around tight spaces like corners and out of tank hatches. During the waning years of the war, Germany was coming up with all kinds of crazy inventions to turn the tide. But a rifle that can shoot around corners probably isn't the answer. As mentioned above, the world was coming and they needed a lot more than a fancy pants rifle to stop the allies. History tells us that this invention did not work as Mustache Man is no more. Kicking off the list at number 10, burials. This list is full of interesting objects that Neanderthals created, like tools or weapons, that kind of stuff. But the idea of burying your loved one after they've passed on, well, that had to start somewhere, didn't it? Ancient Egyptians arguably did it the best. The rich were buried with their treasure and goods because they believed that death on our world was just the start. There was another life afterwards and they would take their treasure and good stuff with them. Bye. Not leaving anything for you, I'm taking all this with me. Neanderthals didn't figure out how to build tombs yet or how to rule for decades. Studies done in Western Europe suggest that Neanderthals would sometimes bury their dead and leave flowers. Flowers or a grave marker of some sort. Pollen was found in northern Iraq's Shandir Caves. Shandir Cave is a staple when it comes to Neanderthal history. And the fact that flowers were found in the middle of a cave system, some humans and emotions are definitely at play here. This was symbolic thinking. The weather didn't make it easy to collect flowers as well. Loved ones passing during an ice age? Yeah, I'll never complain about an outdoor funeral again. Number nine, glass. Imagine making glass for the first time. You would have thought you were a wizard for sure. I watch glass blowing shows now and it looks like wizardry. Wizardry in 4K. Glass blowing is nuts, but it's like, and it's just like a vase all of a sudden. You're like, how did he do that? That's so hot. 
Glass that was naturally occurring, like obsidian for example, that was around and used during the Stone Age. Man-made glass was first used around 6,000 years ago. Man-made glass, yeah, let's talk about it. Archaeologists are pinning Lebanon, North Syria, and ancient Egypt as the birthplace of synthetic glass. The first use of man-made glass were beads, believe it or not. Imagine being the first person to rock beads. Ah, the confidence. Mid 2000 BC, guy decides to glaze up some beads. What an icon. Now we get to do this. The beads, it's a cool door. Number eight, sharpen stones. Some of the oldest tools in history could be laying in front of you and you would have zero idea. You have no clue. Coming from the shores of Lake Tucana in Kenya, these stone tools date back to around three million years ago. Yeah, these are predating the tools before that I mentioned by like 700,000 years. They seem to predate humans in the Homo genus as well, so that's interesting, that's kind of concerning. The volcanic ash and minerals around these sharpened stones date back that far, millions of years old. Stones in history can get a little dirty, to say the least. Not all these ideas that involve stones or sharpened stones are the best. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier shared toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. Perhaps one of the most intriguing parts explains how these flat terracotta discs were found in ancient Greek sites and they had residue on them. They had a certain residue on these sharp rocks. They used to with these stones, yeah. They also discovered a Greek cup which said three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three? I don't know, that's at least five, my friend. Greeks would use stones to wipe. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number seven, axes. The Neolithic period, also referred to as the New Stone Age, introduced us to many vital tools that we still use today. Like an axe, for example. Around 10,000 BC, Neanderthals moved from being these small hunter-gatherer type groups to these much larger settlements. In order to do so, you had to clear a lot of land. Humans evolved at this point in history because that's when we went from flaking stones to grinding them down entirely. We put a little more elbow grease in in order to clear those trees out to build a settlement or two or three or five. Neolithic axes were found at sites in England and Denmark. This one here was found in great condition, alarmingly great condition, like look at this thing. It was uncovered during archeological surveys for a tunnel project in Denmark. Imagine finding a 5,500 year old ax in the middle of your shift. And in case you're wondering, the lack of oxygen in the surrounding clay is the reason why the wooden handle was preserved so well. It almost seems like it was placed there as some type of offering. My first thought is that it's for sure belonging to the Odin Thor family. I don't know, it's, it's placed downwards, you know what I mean? No one touch it. Number six, spears and arrows. Perhaps one of the most vital inventions, one we for sure still use today, always, of course. Arrows and spears were a necessity when it came to hunting, and for people in the Stone Age, all they needed really was wood. They would carve a leaf shape at the end or a triangle at the tip, and then they were mainly used by riders or barefoot hunters. But when it came to hunting, you didn't want to get too close to your prey, or else the wrong team could be claiming victory and eat the other for lunch. You get what I'm saying? So their solution was to huck these spears instead, or make really tiny ones that you can throw or shoot. The oldest bows in history are from 9000 BC. They're the home guard bows. They're found in Northern Europe all the way back from the Mesolithic period. The oldest spears, however, they come from Germany around 400,000 years ago, and they're actually the oldest wooden artifacts ever in history. Imagine being the first person to make a spear. Forget iPhones, a spear? That's a big deal. Number five, flutes. We love a solid flutist. They're flutists, right? Flutest? Uh, dude, I've always wanted to play the flute. Pied Piper, that guy is daring, that guy is wild. He runs around town and plays the jazz flute all day long in tights. Of course I want to be like that, mostly. He's got some flaws. But who is the first person to bust out We Three Kings? Who do we have to blame for all those horrible recorder classes in elementary school? Always the one kid next to you, you're like, drain the spit, it's not on properly. Cover your, use that pinky, cover your thing up. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of Glycine Coastal Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments that have ever been discovered. They were made from bird bone and the ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, so if that's an indication how old they are, they made music out of mammoth ivory. That's old. Brass? Like, no, 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 we haven't found that yet. Number four, paintings. Yeah, why not? Let's include art into this mix. Who was the first person to create art? The Lascaux Caves have been dubbed the prehistoric Sistine Chapel. These cave paintings are from 17,000 years ago and they're beautiful. But if you're thinking about sneaking down there to write Jordan was here, well, you better think again. The cave was opened originally in 1948, but due to carbon dioxide levels and sweat from visitors and just people breathing and being around, it was closed in 1963. 
You can't be breathing on our prehistoric paintings. Get your morning dad breath out of here, sir. We don't want that. Look how beautiful it is. It's really nice. <sighs> Learning about our history is challenging, but it's slowly fading away. We're breathing on it all day long. But these caves in France are not home to the oldest paintings in the world, believe it or not. Altamira Cave in Spain houses cave paintings from 35,000 years ago. The paintings were in such great condition that at first scientists doubted that they were the real deal from that long ago. But in 1902 they were marked as the real deal. These ochre and charcoal images are the most well preserved on the planet. Meanwhile, I'm over here still drawing the sun in the corner of my page. Number three, blades. Around 80,000 years ago, the first ever five o'clock shadow appeared. And it wasn't my family, we, didn't, we don't have those. An upper paleolithic stone tool tradition came from Neanderthals and also the first modern human, it's a big deal. This method here was to shave up your face so you're not, you know, eating your own mustache for dinner. And it was entirely new to the game. During this process, Neanderthals would often break off these sharp flakes from the core of a large stone and then use those chips as blades. Horrible, just imagining that. The Aurignacian culture, appropriately named after the French village of Aurignac, where Neanderthal remains were found back in 1860, this culture is the first modern human in Europe. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, we had to use seashells. And when I say seashells to get rid of hair, I don't mean they would, you know, glide across the skin or anything like that. They would use two shells, then use them together as tweezers. Yeah, one by one. Seashells, can you imagine? That's horrible. Can you hear that? That's the sound of our ancestors plucking their unibrow. Sounds painful, right? Ah, uh, yes, it was. Trapping clamshells were later used in the 19th century because we realized that they're flat enough we could probably just swipe off the hair. It saved a lot of time. Still horrible, but we saved a lot of time. We figured it out. Number two, the wheel. One of the greatest inventions of all time, and now all we want is hover cars. How disrespectful, we just got this thing. The wheel, the idea of the wheel is unlike any other. See, most inventors are inspired by nature. Planes, submarines, bullet trains, all has something to do with nature, bird beaks, flying, underwater, all that crap. Nothing in nature resembles a wheel at all. The closest thing really are tumbleweeds and dung beetles. My favorite thing to mention on this uh, channel, the poop rollers. Potter wheels were found from Mesopotamia around 5,500 years ago. Now it's hard to pinpoint who used the wheel first and where, I mean, given the fact that it was that long ago, but the front runners so far aside from Mesopotamia are the Tripoli people of modern Ukraine because the word wheel literally is derived from their language, but the wheelbarrow may have appeared in ancient Greece around 600 BCE. They say you can't reinvent the wheel, but I feel like you can, at least this early in time, I feel like we did. Number one, fire. I mean, next to the wheel, this one was, you know, it's pretty important, I'd say. When was fire first used in history? Well, a study done in 2011 was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science, and it showed that Neanderthals were firebenders. Not really, no. They were just, after carefully examining over 140 fireplace sites in Europe, the University of Colorado Boulder found some stone artifacts and charcoal dating back to 400,000 years ago. Now, of course, these fireplaces were used to cook meals, but at the same time, tools were created during this process. Melting things and moving them around, kind of like glass blowing, heat makes things come to life. Neanderthals would use something called pitch. Pitch was made by burning the bark of birch trees. It allowed them to attach stones to wooden shafts, which is a pretty big deal when it came to hammers and tools. Inventing glue is one thing, but doing it while you're working the barbecue? Whose dad was that? That's impressive, that's so impressive. Number 10, Nintendo 64 Disk Drive. For use everywhere in the 90s, nothing really compared to the Nintendo 64. Sure, Sega was trying and Sony's brand new PlayStation was making waves in the video game market. And, and it had great games too, but pound for pound, the Nintendo 64 had it all. Amazing single player games and multiplayer that literally paved the way forward for other games of the future. I mean, just listen to these games. Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Super Smash Brothers, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, GoldenEye, Perfect Dark, Banjo-Kazooie, Mario Kart 64, Mario Party, WWF No Mercy. That one's one of my favorites, brother. I mean, that is just a few of the games to mention. It truly was an amazing console, and for the first try at 3D, very, very impressive. Well, how could it be on this list then if it was so great, Chetty, you're probably saying to yourself. Well, in case you didn't know, in the late 90s, well, it was changing times and CD-ROMs were all the rage. This is why in secret Nintendo was developing an attachment for the Nintendo 64 that would play disc games. However, after a troubled development and skeptical sales, it was only released in Japan, like a lot of good things. This was not one of them. Where it sold poorly as only nine games were ever made for it, making one of the most beloved consoles of all time 
well, it left it with an ugly blemish on its legacy. Number 9, Aquanotes. It sounds strange, but a lot of good ideas come from the shower. Maybe it's the isolation, maybe it's the smell of Irish spring, or a hot shower on a cold winter's day. Oh, it's one of my favorites. But for some strange reason, a lot of people's best ideas come to you in the shower. Who would have thought? For me, it's jokes. As a comedian, I'm always thinking about stuff like that, and I swear I've come up with some real gems in the shower. It's too bad, though, that when I get out of the shower, I forget. Too bad when I get out of the shower, I forgot. Oh man. Well, clearly, I need the Aqua Notes, a waterproof notepad so I can write down my thoughts and thinks without my Blues Clues notepad getting waterlogged. Oh, sounds great, right? Okay, sure, I guess it's helpful, but if I was using someone's shower and they had a notepad in their shower, well, it, it would be strange. Hey, sorry whoever uses this next. Shave my back hair and clog the drain. Sawy, XOXO. It's just a weird invention. It's just it's not good. Number eight, new Coca Cola. To me, there's nothing better than sitting in the hot summer sun, slathered in sunscreen, in my Muskoka chair, because I'm a Canadian, and beside me is an ice cold Coke. I love beer, but there's just something about it I love. Cheers, Coca Cola fans. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Now, I like the original recipe the most. However, cherry and vanilla are great. I'm just a vanilla guy. During the 1980s, Coke made a bold decision and released a new Coke formula. It was a bold decade, so, you know, had to make moves. In 1985, the new formula made it past testers, but when it reached the public, there was literal public outcry to bring back the old stuff. The good stuff. Only a few short months later, shelves are restocked with classic Coke, bringing back the old formula, which may have also been a genius marketing technique. Hmm. Number seven, red dye number two. My mom was not the best cook on planet Earth. I, that's just the truth. However, however, hold on, everyone jumps all over me. Her baking was out of this world. Cookies, banana bread, cupcakes, Yorkshire puddings. I had to stay quiet during that one. She said they never rise if I did, if I didn't be quiet. You name it, Mama Chetty, she made it great. She used all kinds of ingredients, except for anything with red dye number two. She always said it wasn't good for me, partially because I was, well, a little tanky kid and hyper, but also because during the late 70s, she was told that a certain red dye number two was extremely harmful. Some scientists believed it was carcinogenic. The red dye was in a lot of stuff, plus, who can blame them with a mouthwatering name like red dye number two? Oh, I want some just thinking about it. M&Ms were so concerned with the rumor that they removed red from their palette of colors for a whole decade. Maybe mom was onto something. Number six, Sega Genesis add-ons. While the Nintendo 64 disk drive was ridiculous, the Sega Genesis add-ons were 100% ludicrous and way worse in my opinion. Mainly with two key add-ons, the Sega CD, which saw more use than the Nintendo 64 disk drive, with such classics like Night Trap, which I'm not even sure what to classify that game as. I it's a sleepover, and you got this cameras, there's burglar. It's weird, I don't know. But besides that cult classic, there really isn't anything on there. There was also the 32X add on that works with all your 16 bit Sega games, but also can enhance and has a select library of updated games for the 32X or 32 bit era. Sega was trying to keep the Genesis alive, and with those sales, you can't blame them. Sonic sells, baby. However, without a total support of these add ons, lack of games, and being sold separately, it just wasn't as popular as. Well, the regular Genesis or Sega would hope it to be. Also, not to mention, each add on had to be separately powered, so that's three AC adapters you gotta plug in just to play on the couch with friends. Too much, dude. Too much. Number five, the Go Go Pillow. Okay, here's the scenario. You just sit down after a long day of work or school. You start flipping through TV stations, and then you see an infomercial with a dad sitting down on his couch after a long day, and he's trying to use his iPad, but it's out of his baby boomer capacity. That happens with technology sometimes. My mom, she needs help. So then a happy narrator introduces the Go Go Pillow, the comfy pillow that helps you relax with your iPad. It has like four extra flaps of fabric to hold dad's iPad in. It holds it in place so that he can watch History Channel in peace. I would just like to argue that any pillow with extra flaps can achieve this. You don't really need this pillow. It, really, anything can hold it in place. This or anything with small grooves. It's all you need to hold your iPad. Also, you know, your hands, your arms. I mean, I'm lazy, but even I can still use that. Come on, Dad. We... Stop. Come on. Number four, zoomies. The powered glasses that act like binoculars. Perfect for bird watchers, hunters, concert goers that are stuck in the nosebleeds, grandma doing her needlework, or grandpa when he can't see the TV. Even though I swear old people can see, it's more of a hearing issue. Every, every old person I know, it's more, what did you see there, boy? 
a silly looking pair of glasses that promises enhanced vision, and in reality, well, they were just thick black glasses that not only looked ugly, but also according to user reviews, don't really work that well. And when the enhanced zoom feature is being used, the image is blurry, almost like as seen on TV products only work on TV and don't do what they say on the box at home. Hmm. Number three, the better marriage blanket. We've all been there. It's late at night. Husband and wife are getting ready for bed. That's when the man of the house and all his handsomeness rolls over and lets one rip with a thunderous cheek clapping wind. Gross, dude. Not like I'd ever do that, right, Chris? Not only did he just ruin the feng shui of the nightly reading, but he also left the stench in the sheets. Ugh, gross. Well, not anymore. With the better marriage blanket that claims it's made with the military technology to help sift out a husband's, uh, well, barbecue beer flatulence. As much as wives, girlfriends everywhere would be throwing money at a product like that, it doesn't really work that way. The truth of the matter is, some men, husbands, and fathers have superpowers, and no bed sheet order with a bad credit card is going to fix that. Number two, Sham Wow. Does this really need an introduction? In the late 2000s, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing Vince the Sham Wow guy, earning fame as the orange rag that cleans up all messes at car and boat shows. Eventually, it earned a commercial that seemed to play nonstop, or at least from my memory, it did. A towel that can seemingly clean up any mess water, juice, cola, wine, and grab it right through the carpet with a simple pat. It's very simple, very beautiful. One for the house, one for the RV, and one for the boat, said middle class America. Too bad it wasn't enough to clean up the legal mess that Vince the Shamwell guy got himself into. Uh oh, where's the OxyClean when you need it? And finally, in our number one spot, sauna pants. Lastly, today we have the sauna pants, the latest in weight loss technology that doesn't work. Oh, what? Your grandma probably had a belt sander version of this that would basically just strap around you and vibrate the person all over to lose weight. But despite all that vigorous shaking, she was still the same at bingo night. What? I know, right? Crazy. Well, the sauna pants boast the same thing. You sit back, relax, and let the sweat do the work. A ridiculous looking pair of pants that has to be plugged in. Sizes don't fit all, which is kind of silly if people are trying to lose weight. You'd think there would be bigger sizes. Not that I want a pair or anything. And of course, it just doesn't work. Unless you were trying to make a very interesting stand in the couch, then that would work. Absolutely. Number 10, the hula chair. Here's another gem from the depths of the infomercial vault of nonsense. And seriously, there's a lot. Look, as a Canadian, we still love consumerism. Sure, but not as much as the United States, but there's still a lot of mom and dad sitting on the couch every Saturday with the fat credit card, just waiting for the next life changing product to come across the screen. So that means we get to see those awful infomercials too. You're not alone, Americans. That includes the hula chair, the latest mechanized weight loss product that promises to keep you in shape with minimal effort. You should be the spokesman. Well, sign me and the rest of America up, baby, because the hula chair is a motorized chair that swivels to keep you moving while sitting. Something like this, a little hula movement for you, something like that, wow. Demonstrations of the chair show multiple speeds, the fastest looking more like a violent throwing than weight loss, and uh, well, no surprise, it doesn't work, and uh, they're just not really around anymore. For good reason. Number nine, the potty putter. This one's ridiculous. Golf, the sport for wealthy businessmen across the world and for every schmuck who wishes they could get into the clubhouse. That's me, I like the clubhouse, it's cool. I don't mind a round of golf, but just I, I'm more excited for the ice cold beers during the day. It's why I prefer mini golf, what can I say? I like the simple things in life. So maybe I should get a potty putter. A miniature golf set for the bathroom, just what everyone needs, me to spend more time in the bathroom, hog out the toilet. Sorry boys and girls. Complete with green putter, two golf balls, and a little hole with a flag. Now you can practice your putt and grout the tile at the same time. I'm not sure where to begin with this, but if there's anything to be said, it's that toilet time is toilet time. I don't think I have to tell you guys how unsanitary sharing a golf club the bathroom is. Ooh, stinky. But hey, at least it comes with a do not disturb sign so people know you're getting your practice in. Ooh, better not disturb dad. He's on back of the whole nine and he's about to put it in for, uh, for a good one there. He's about to put her in there. Number eight, the edge of glory. This is another case of excellent marketing through cheesy commercials at 2 a.m. The Edge of Glory is a knife sharpener that promises to take all of your old kitchen knives and turn them into a samurai's blade. Okay, not an actual katana, but the sharpness. 
of one. As Anthony Sullivan demonstrates in the infomercial, there's nothing it can't do. Like I said before, the Edge of Glory is just clever marketing. It doesn't do anything that other whetstones or blade sharpeners don't do, and there's no way they're going to outperform the competitor at three easy payments of $29.99. So call now. No, I'm just kidding. It's on this worst invention list because they slap a new name on something that already exists, and plus, it's probably made a lot cheaper than the real stuff, and they're just begging you to bust out your credit card. So yeah, that's why it's on here. Makes sense. Number seven, the Euro Club. Back to the golf inventions because Dad, sure. Okay, let's make a scenario. It's July long weekend, and you're spending time in the golf course like all the other dads who don't want to spend time with their families. It's hot out, so you've been slamming back beers like a frat party. Plus, the older guys just want to see the beer girl come back with another round. Gross. Beer guys can be gross sometimes. Anyway, it's a busy day, and you're playing between groups. All of a sudden, you have to use the washroom. But walking all the way back to the clubhouse is not an option. Thank Thank goodness you have your Euro Club, the discreet and sanitary option for urinating on the golf course. God damn, that's gross. A thick handled golf club fits right into your bag with the others, but it's actually a portable washroom. Look, I get it, cute idea, but I'm a man and I know men. We'd rather just go find a bush, complete with a thick golf club and a little little blanket to put over yourself so you have a little bit of privacy while you do your business. We should have one for the gym. You don't want like a dumbbell or something. You know what I mean? That'd be the, see now there's an idea. That's a smart idea. One for the gym. Number six, Skinny's Instant Lifts. Okay, so the edge of glory is shifty. It's shady, but at least it has the potential to sharpen your blades, which I think we can all agree having dull blades sucks. Huh. See, I should be a spokesman. This is a product that's not only something you have in the home, but well, you probably have lots of it. Basically trying to pull the wool or the tape over consumers' eyes. To sum it up, Skinny's instant lifts are strips of adhesive tape that can fold, pull, and keep in place unwanted saggy skin, fat, and just the more flabby parts of the human body. We all get old. It happens. It's happening to me. I'm getting older. And we all don't look like we did when we were 18. I look pretty close, but I'm getting older. And we can all understand how people would hand cash over the table to look better or look like they did when they were 18. Can you blame them? You, you, you can't. That being said, taping yourself up like a third grade science project isn't going to help. So in a nutshell, they're just trying to sell you scotch tape. It doesn't... That's, that's a terrible invention. Let me just uh, let me just take myself up here. I'm ready for the party in a minute. Let me just hold, pull all this in. Yeah. No. Number five. Ch -ch -ch Chia. <laughs> Chia pets. I know everyone has heard of the Chia pets. Shout out to all the gardeners out there. How are the strawberries growing this year? I hope good. Yeah. The Chia Pet is a terracotta pot filled with chia seeds that will eventually grow chia sprouts. The catch? The terracotta planter or base is almost always featuring some sort of recognizable icon. So when the chia grows, it resembles the hair, fur, or some sort of color contrasting part of that icon. Some include Chewbacca, Weird Al Yankovic, Donald Trump, Abraham Lincoln, Yoda, Baby Yoda, Scooby-Doo, SpongeBob, Shrek, Bob Ross, Homer Simpson, and many, many more icons, especially of Americana iconography. Whew, man, that's a mouthful. This one isn't the worst, you know, because you need plants around the house. You gotta have some plants. It's, it brings the house together. It's just hard to imagine folks dishing out dough for a cool terracotta pot and a commercial tune that everybody knows. Ch -ch 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 -chia. Number four, shag carpet. On a personal level, I'm not a carpet guy. Chris, this, get your mind out of the gutter. Get your, get your mind right out of that gutter, buddy. No, no. On a personal level, I'm not a carpet guy. I'm just too much of a man. Or at least that's what my mom says. Okay, sure, I spill food all over myself all the time, but I'm not that bad, ladies. Come on, I put the toothpaste cap back on after I'm done brushing my teeth, so I can't be that bad. I'm just a hardwood floor kind of guy. I think it looks nicer, it lasts longer, and is way easier to clean, especially when you got guys like me around. So you can understand why I put shag carpet on this list. Popularized in the late 60s and early 70s, there wasn't a home magazine around that didn't feature shag carpet. Known for its long fibers and wacky colors, the shag carpets resemble that of an animal hide that never stopped growing fur. Very popular with the hippie and free love crowds of the 60s and 70s, like I said, but it's hard to clean, ugly, and sometimes strange enough, a tripping hazard. And that's, I don't like that in the house. Tripping's bad. I feel the other day, it really hurt. I got a blister on my finger now, it's bad. 
Number three, the lava lamp. Where would the 60s and 70s be without shag carpet and the lava lamp? It kind of goes hand in hand along with the shag carpet. In another fad from that era, it seemed every college dorm around wasn't complete without one. That being said, they're more of an eye candy than a functional light. Invented by Edward Craven Walker as he was bored one day in a bar. So a lot of good ideas start. Sure, thanks Edward, but no one ever says, Oh no, it's so dark in here, better turn on my lava lamp. Uh, you got my, uh, right, thank you, perfect. Trouble is, to make that lava flow and that desired effect, it needs a heat source, which usually is done through a light bulb underneath the main canister of lava. Now, while most modern lava lamps are completely safe, the old ones? Well, you gotta be careful around older electronics like that, especially if you've ever seen Mythbusters. While the light bulb may not be enough heat to cause any issues, an external or excessive heat could render the lava lamp to uh, erupt. And it's not good. See that episode of Mythbusters? Oh, it's not good. It, uh, it's lethal, actually. <laughs> Number two, the power glove. The Power Glove. Could you really own anything more 80s than the Power Glove? The Power Glove was an accessory for the NES that allowed players to use motion controls on 2D games. Complete with a retro sensor bar and number pad to input codes for your controller to work with the current game that you're playing. Well, the truth is folks, it, it just sucked. It doesn't work properly, it gets sweaty and smelly easily because a lot of it's a actually just a glove. At the time, there was no internet, so if you didn't have a code book or knew the code to input into the glove for your game, you literally couldn't use it to play the games that you wanted to use it for, thus rendering it useless. And I argue that's a bad invention. It's so silly. I'm playing with power! Number one, Rob the Robot. Lastly, another NES accessory, except this one was for lonely Nintendo players. Basically, Rob the Robot was a second player when you didn't have one. He was battery operated and used a variety of spinning tops to push down buttons that you had, well, some control of to simulate the efforts of a second player. The issue here, well, he requires both D and AA batteries. He's slow. Oftentimes, after extended use, struggles to pick up the spinners he uses to input controls into the game. And he's officially only compatible with two games. Stack Up and Gyromite, which I can tell from the audience's silence right now that they've never played those games on the NES. Duck Hunt, Mario, Zelda, Stack Up? No, you didn't have Stack Up, don't lie, you didn't have it, you never had it. Number 10, the Smello Vision. Oh, this is bad. We've come a long way since the dawn of filmmaking. Imagine all of your movies costing five cents and all in black and white with no sound. Ooh, what a time to be alive. Today, obviously, we have color, sound, virtual reality, and those moving boxes of the movies, which Honestly, I'm not crazy about it. They shake too much, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. Same with the 3D, those, those glasses that we used to wear, we don't really do the 3D anymore, it was bad. Anyway, some people think that's not enough. Some people want more. Enter the smell vision created by a man named Hans Lüb. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that just writes itself, doesn't it? The idea is that while you are watching a movie, you can smell the smells on screen. A field of grass, a car chase with burning rubber, a breakfast scene. Mm. My issue is what happens if I leave the smell of vision on and I fall asleep on the couch and reruns of Dirty Jobs comes on? Ooh, yucky. Or better yet, you guys have a smell of vision and you're watching my bloopers. Uh oh, stinky. That wouldn't be very good, would it? Number nine, the virtual boy. This one's just crazy. I I doubt many people would remember this, and in Nintendo's defense, they usually know what they're doing. Well, most of the time. Usually. There's so many remasters that they could do. It's a license to print money. I don't know why they don't. Come on, Nintendo, I'm waiting for it. The Virtual Boy, however, oh boy. I wouldn't expect many to have seen it since the sales were poor. The Virtual Boy was a 32-bit portable console that was basically a headset, except, you know, there's no straps to put it around your head, but a stand so you can play games on it while Laying prone? Yeah, I'm not sure. My back hurts just looking at it. Just doesn't make a lot of sense. The main selling point was the graphics. It was a big topic back in the 90s. The Virtual Boy was capable of 3D, which was huge for the time, way ahead of its time. Except it was stereographic 3D and monochrome red. Everything was just shades of red. So watching footage of the gameplay gives me a headache as I'm sure playing it would. So I can see why laying on your living room floor playing this well, it sucks. Number eight, the black powder mousetrap. Mice, 
They're everywhere, and they suck. At least the wild ones. Some people got cute pets. So we place mouse traps to get rid of them. However, sometimes we get our fingers cut, which also sucks. Oh man, it hurts really bad. Or if you're a friend of Johnny Knoxville, it hurts all over. They, they do a lot of weird stuff with mouse traps. Love those guys. However, one design of mouse trap I think is the worst because it could potentially end your life is the black powder mouse trap. It was essentially just like ye olde cannons of the time. Black powder, big iron ball, except just on a much tinier scale. And in the house, because you know, having a cannon go off in the house is a great idea. Sure, let's just have that. that. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Number seven, the baby cage. Living in large cities can be difficult. Toronto being the third largest in North America, well, I can relate. It's crazy we're that big. Things get busy even in the suburbs here. There's a hustle and a bustle that small cities and towns just don't get. Now, back in the early 20th century, this was still the case, except there wasn't the same emphasis on park life, biking, and enjoying what fresh air actually is in the city like there is in my Modern cities today. We've done better since then. And there's nothing more important than fresh air for babies. So that's why in the 1920s the baby cage was invented. Basically, it was a wire cage that hangs out of your fifth floor apartment window, like that massive AC unit that hasn't worked properly since McDonald's ran out of Szechuan sauce. Obviously, I don't need to tell you why this is a bad idea, and not too long after, it was outlawed. It's just don't, don't, that's high up, it could drop. Yeah, no, bad idea. Not a good idea. Number six, this one's for the older crowd, the Ford Pinto. Remember those bad boys? I never had the pleasure of being in one or owning one myself, but I swear to God, every time my family got together, the men would sit around and talk about cars that they own. It's kind of a man thing to do, I guess. Even though they all had the same conversation the last time, which is just like only a couple months ago. And one model that always comes up is the Ford Pinto. Today, cars get recalled all the time, but in the age of affordable family vehicles and quality, the Ford Pinto stood out, especially because there was a chance the Pinto could burst into flames, which is arguably the worst thing a car could do. Besides not work, I, I'd argue not working is better than bursting into flames. A few other major issues really set back what I think is a very sleek and appealing vehicle to both mom and dad and the family. Number five, the spaghetti fork. Make sure you put my special spaghetti fork on the table. I need to eat my pasta and gabagool. Italians and lovers of the best cuisine on earth, in my opinion, I love Italian cuisine, get ready to cringe. The twirling spaghetti fork is a battery operated fork that twirls when you push a button, so you no longer suffer the burden of twirling your own spaghetti. Listen, I'm a big dude, I'm lazy, I love staying in after a long week of work and playing video games, probably my favorite thing to do. Yeah, sometimes I order in because I don't feel like getting up, but not twirling mom's spaghetti? Come on, twirling the spaghetti that, I argue that's the best part. No dinner with no no should require double A batteries, in my opinion. I'm just saying. You bring a fork. Why you bring us a fork? Number four, hydrogen blimps. It really must have been something to witness humans gaining flight. Something so previously impossible was now not only possible, but something that you had to pay money for, which is how you know it was very successful. Large jumbo jets full of croc wearing tours headed to slob attractions was still a thing of the future. We're not there yet. This is still the early 1900s. We'll get there. So how do we get people to places in large numbers and still manage to be opulent? Said a bunch of people in the early 1900s. Airships, said Germany, who took the blimp game to the next level. However, a lot of these blimps made a cut in their design, if you will. To help save on money, the airships were filled with the much more cheaper hydrogen, which in large quantities is extremely volatile. The Hindenburg is a great example. Well, we could fill it with a safe fuel, uh, but it's really expensive, but we could fill it with the fuel that could destroy the whole thing, and that's like 10 times cheaper. Well, I'll fill it with that then, why would you not? Number three, flying car. Maybe it's because we love the idea of breaking new ground, setting precedents, or we really just want to live with the Jetsons. It was a cool cartoon. The Mizar flying car was designed by a group of engineers in the early 1970s, using the very famous Ford Pinto, like previously mentioned, because, well, it sucks on the ground, so it's gotta be good in the sky, right? Right, that makes sense. Well, no. Besides the mechanical issues, it would be a hard sell as, well, you know, the average American doesn't have flying experience or not to mention a runway in their backyard. Plus, we have trouble with drones today. Imagine if it was raining Ford Pintos. Yikes. Mom, there's another Ford Pinto in the living room. It wouldn't, it wouldn't go very well, would it? No. Number two, the pet rock. This one's so stupid. It's just a rock. Legit, that's all it is. A fad about buying a rock and naming it. Oftentimes, including those little googly eyes to make you believe it's alive because yeah, okay. It's a ridiculous invention, it has no use. However, what it actually is, is a lesson in great marketing. Something weird enough that can be marketed quite easily, sold at an affordable price, and something that is already familiar with the people everywhere. 
So it actually makes sense, even if it is a bad invention. And number one, uh, this one, it's just so true, the Segway. About 15 years ago, these bad boys were all the rage. Basically, it's an electric scooter on two wheels with a handle to lean forward and lean back, or perhaps reverse. While there was some success in malls and airports, there wasn't that many in public. The main reason? Well, it's no different than a scooter or a bike, really, and uh, well, it kind of feels like an attempt to reinvent the wheel when we don't need it.